Good morning. I want to welcome everyone to this morning's meeting of the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Legislative Operations and Elections. Um, Ms. Hoffaker, uh, please call the roll. Senator Daly. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Gonzalez. Assemblyman Hibbets. Here. Assemblywoman Miller. Assemblywoman Mosca. Here. Chair Ormshaw. Present. Ms. Hoffaker, please mark Assemblywoman Gonzalez present when she arrives, and please mark Senator Seavers Gansert as excused. Uh, before I get to housekeeping announcements, there's a there's a something we skipped at our first meeting that I just wanted to take a little time uh, for member introductions, uh, committee member introductions. I'm very fortunate to have some uh, colleagues I really uh, enjoy working with and really respect on this committee. And I'd like everyone to just take a few minutes to introduce themselves, include the district you represent, and um, your interest in this interim committee. So if we could start, uh, we'll start in Carson City with Senator Daly, and then we'll come back here, and we'll start with Assemblyman Miller and, and kind of move down the dais. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Skip Daly. I represent Senate District 13 in uh, Washoe County. Uh, served on the... Legislative Operations uh, and Elections Committee twice in the Assembly and uh, this last session uh, in the Senate. Um, so I have a lot of interest and in, in happy to be on this uh, committee and uh, looking forward to the work we're going to do and uh, designing some legislation for next session. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Daly. Assemblywoman Miller. Thank you, Chair. Hi, I'm Brittany Miller, and I'm the Assemblywoman for District 5 here in Clark County. I served as the chair in the Assembly for Legislative Operations and Elections back in 2021, and then last session for 23, I was vice chair. I also chaired interim, last interim, for our joint uh, committee. So here I am. Looks like I've just been here for a while. So thanks for having me, Chair. We are very lucky to get to work with you and, and to have a former chair of this interim committee on this committee. Uh, Vice Chair Mosca. Thank you, Chair. My name is Erica Mosca. I represent Assembly District 14 in East Las Vegas. I'm excited to be the vice chair of this committee. I have never been on legislative elections and operations, but it's been great already to learn, and I'm excited to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to skip myself, and I'll go to Assemblyman Hibbets. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Assemblyman Brian Hibbets, Assembly District 13 in the northwest portion of the Las Vegas Valley. I uh, served on the uh, legislative operations and elections during the 82nd session, and I'm just happy to be here. Well, we are very happy to have you on the committee. Uh, Assemblywoman Dickman. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Jill Dickman. I represent Assembly District 31, mostly Sparks, and some of the North Valleys up here in Washoe County. I uh, served on my jobs. This this would be my second session and also my second interim, and I find it to be a very interesting and enjoyable committee. And I love working with you, Chair. Well, it's always been a pleasure working with you uh, through the different sessions, and uh, thank you for, so much for your service to your district and to this committee. And I'm James Orenshaw. I represent State Senate District 21 here in Southern Nevada, and I've been very lucky to get to serve on the Legislative Operations and Elections Committee, both in the Assembly and in the State Senate. And I've been just uh, very pleased at seeing the progress we've made through different sessions on uh, trying to make democracy more accessible and allow for a lot, of, a lot of public participation. I've been very proud of, of the work of the legislature through the years and the work of this committee and, and the recommendations from the interim committee. So I'm very, very honored to get to chair this committee this interim. Uh, so with that, I'd like to move on to some housekeeping uh, matters. Uh, members who are joining us virtually, please be sure to keep your video on so that we know that we still have a quorum. Please also be sure to mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize background noise. Uh, for members who are on video, if you have a question uh, and for any reason I don't realize you have a question, please raise your hand or even uh, jump in and ask to be recognized because I don't want to miss any members' questions or comments if members have any questions or comments. 
Agenda items on our agenda today may be taken in a different order than listed. Two or more agenda items may be combined for consideration. An item may be removed from the agenda or discussion of an item on this agenda may be delayed at any time. Meeting materials can be accessed on our committee's webpage located on the Nevada Legislature's website. You can also sign up for electronic notifications related to our committee's activities on the Nevada Legislature's website. We will have a public comment period at the beginning of the meeting and also at the end of the meeting. Public comment will be limited to two minutes per speaker. Members of the public may also provide testimony in some additional ways, all of which are listed on the agenda. To call in for public comment, please dial the following phone number, 888-475-4499. Again, that phone number is 888-475-4499. When prompted for a meeting ID, this is the meeting ID you need to enter, 880-2469-4191, and then you press the, the pound sign. Again, that is 880-2469-4191. Then you press the pound sign, and then there will be prompts with instructions about how to participate in public comment. If you'd like to provide written comments, please submit them electronically by email to the following email address. And it's L-O-E in all capital letters, and then capital I, and then interim, N-T-E-R-I-M, the at symbol lcb.state.nv.us. And again, that is on our agenda. You can also mail comments to our committee to be included in the record to the Legislative Council Bureau Research Division at the following address, 401 South Carson Street, Carson City, Nevada, 89701. And for those who still have a fax machine, lucky people if you do, <laughs> the other day I was trying to find one and found out it's very hard to find an old-fashioned fax machine, you can fax your comments to the following fax number, 775-684-6400. Again, that fax number for the Nevada Legislature is 775-684-6400. Finally, I'd like to ask members to please silence your electronic devices, especially cell phones and laptops, during the meeting. And again, we ask for respect and courtesy to all members of the committee, all members of the public, from everyone participating. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to agenda item number two, and that is public comment. I'll start here at the Sawyer Building in Las Vegas. Is there anyone who wishes to make public comment? Kim, I don't see anyone here at the Sawyer Building. Uh, Senator Daly up in Carson City, is there anyone who wishes to make public comment? Nobody is coming forward. Okay, thank you, Senator Daly. Uh, broadcasting, is there anyone on the phone lines who wishes to make public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. Okay, and I will just maybe give it another 30 seconds of broadcasting just to see if there's anybody who is trying to call in. And I'll check back with you in about 30 seconds. While we're waiting to see if anybody's trying to call in, I neglected to mention that for anyone who wants to make public comment, please remember to state your name for the record and limit your comments to two minutes. We're trying to be fair to everybody. That's why we have the time limit. Staff here at LCB will time each speaker during public comment to ensure that everyone has had an equal amount of time to speak. Now broadcasting, I just want to check back. Is there anyone who has called in now who wishes to make public comment? Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working, but we have no callers. Okay, thank you. With that, members, I'd like to move on to agenda item number three. All members were emailed the draft minutes from the last committee hearing, uh, and they were also posted on the committee's website. Uh, at this time, if there are any corrections, additions, deletions, anything that members found that needs to be corrected, I'd open it up. Otherwise, I would accept a motion to approve the minutes for the February 22nd meeting. Motion to approve the minutes I have for the February 22nd. 
I have a motion from Vice Chair Mosca. I have a, a, Senator Daly, would you mind making that a second? Second. Second. Okay, thank you, Senator Daly. Any discussion on the motion? All right, not seeing any discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And Ms. Hoffaker, if you'd please note that that passed unanimously. I'd like to now move on to agenda item number four, where we are going to be uh, having presentations related to voting for tribal members. And here, I wonder if I could just take one item slightly out of order. I wonder if I could start with what we've listed as, number, as letter B instead of A. Nevada election officials, good morning. And I see we have Mark Beloshin, our Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections here in Carson City. And uh, we, we're, we have some other presenters. Uh, but I, I'd like to take that out of order and then go to uh, our representatives of Nevada tribal members, A. But, but if I could start with, with letter B now, the presentation from Deputy Secretary of State Mark Beloshin. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mark Velashin, for the record, I'll pull up the presentation. Uh, I do want to note also that uh, I'm joined by some colleagues in Carson City today as well, uh, who I believe are going to be joining us at the table as well. Uh, it's uh, our Chief Deputy, uh, Mr. Gabriel Licara, uh, along with our Tribal Outreach Coordinator, uh, Mr. Cal Boone, who will be introducing themselves here momentarily as well. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to neglect anybody up in Carson City. Please uh, feel free to come up to the table up in Carson City and appreciate you being here and us being able to do this, both parts of the state. Perfect. So, Mr. Chair, uh, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, we can. Uh, in Carson City, are you able to see the presentation, Senator Daly? <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And, and again, Mark Velashin, uh, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the record. Uh, thank you for having us here today to speak about this extremely important topic. Uh, I'll start our brief presentation uh, first by discussing slightly the, the nature of the bills, Senate Bill 216 and Senate Bill 327 uh, from the 2023 legislative session. Uh, I'll then turn it over to our Chief Deputy in Carson City, who will talk through a little bit of the uh, logistics behind their implementation uh, before finally uh, talking through some of the specific actions that were taken uh, to provide that information before going to questions from the committee. Thank you very much. Please proceed in any order that's most convenient. And if I don't see someone in Carson City wants to speak, please jump in and let me know if I missed you. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so to start with, uh, Senate Bill 216, uh, there were some changes, uh, again, that this bill um, created and required. Uh, the intent being, as I understood it, uh, was to help facilitate and increase opportunities for voting for tribal members across our state. Uh, that really was the overarching theme of both Senate Bills 216 uh, as well as 327. Uh, Senate Bill 216, uh, initially, uh, one of the, the methods, rather, that Senate Bill 216 addressed that uh, was by requiring uh, meetings uh, between the county and city election officials with the tribal leadership. Uh, this, in part, helped address uh, a bit of a challenge over the last few years that has been identified, where, uh, again, well-intentioned uh, folks at the county and city uh, want to uh, provide services to their constituents across the county, uh, regardless of the location, but oftentimes uh, struggled to identify where or who to, to communicate with. Uh, and there was a little bit of miscommunication in, at times back and forth between tribal communities uh, and the election officials across the state. Uh, this, this element, this provision of Senate Bill 216 ultimately was uh, facilitated in part uh, by our tribal um, our tribal outreach coordinator and uh, and I'm sorry our tribal liaison our current chief deputy uh, who helped facilitate a lot of those discussions those discussions between uh, tribal leadership and county election officials uh, really focused on a number of topics again the the specifics of which are included on this slide uh, with the intent being again to ensure that uh, the, the logistics were in place to support voting at uh, tribal locations across our state uh, many of these uh, addressed and, and specifically called out um, through those discussions the challenges faced uh, in remote locations for uh, identifying and hiring poll workers, uh, the, the travel times to get to many of our tribal uh, colonies and reservations across the state that are that are in very remote locations and working through essentially the reverse planning to make sure that those locations were set up and in place for both early voting uh, and election day as appropriate. 
Another uh, provision in uh, Senate Bill 216 um, related to the use of the effective absentee system for elections. Uh, the EASE system that we will be talking about later on the agenda today uh, was a system initially created for supporting our overseas and military voters. Uh, the bill uh, ultimately opened up and enabled tribal voters who live on a colony or reservation as well uh, to use this system um, to cast a ballot. And again, we'll, we'll be discussing that in more detail here shortly. Senate Bill 327, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, altered the, uh, the process uh, by which uh, a, a tribal nation could uh, have and establish a, a polling location, uh, either during early voting, on election day, or a mail ballot drop box. Uh, previously, uh, prior to the passage of the bill, uh, it was more of a, an opt-in system uh, where the tribal leadership would reach out to the county election official and request uh, the, the establishment of a process, uh, with the assumption being that anyone who did not uh, proactively reach out uh, would not receive a, a polling location. Uh, Senate Bill 327 uh, inverted that uh, and made it an opt-out process where uh, the assumption is that across the state, all of our tribal locations would be receiving a polling place, ballot drop box um, to support the needs of their voters unless otherwise identified by a, a member of the tribal leadership. Uh, this bill, uh, again, combined with those required uh, discussions early on, uh, effectively, uh, again, ensured that everyone was on the same page about locations, the requirements, and, and otherwise, too. And we'll speak to that here in a minute. And, and then just a little bit more in detail on uh, Senate Bill 327 also. Uh, when we talk about you know, those discussions from the previous bill uh, and what does it mean to, to opt out uh, or basically identify what, what the preference is, the, the bill identified uh, that, again, tribal uh, nations could have a, a polling place on certain days or certain hours, again, ultimately determined uh, through those discussions between the county uh, election officials and the tribal leadership. Uh, they could ask for uh, or clarify having maybe just a, a mail ballot drop box if they preferred um, or, or other options as well. And it did require that the counties comply with those requests. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, before going into the specifics uh, of, of how it went, uh, I will turn it over to uh, Chief Deputy DeCara for his comments. Thank you very much, Deputy Walshin. Chief Deputy DeCara, thank you for joining us today in Carson City. Please proceed whenever you're ready. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Always a pleasure. Um, Chief Deputy uh, Secretary of State Gabriel DeCara, for the record, I also serve as the Tribal Liaison for the Secretary of State's office. Um, as Deputy Velashin said, I worked um, uh, closely with, with uh, several of the counties as, as well as folks from a number of tribes on the implementation of these bills. Um, Deputy Velashin is, is going to talk about sort of the results and some of what, uh, what we saw in a moment, but there are a few points that, that I want to make clear. Um, we believe that these bills uh, were um, absolutely steps in the right direction in terms of expanding uh, uh, access to the ballot um, and encouraging participation in our democracy for folks uh, that, that live on, on colonies or reservations. Um, and that was the result of constant communication between the tribes, between the counties, uh, between the state. Um, Any time uh, something changes, anytime there's something new, um, it can take a while to uh, uh, figure out the, the, the uh, appropriate next steps. So there were a lot of early conversations around um, what does it mean to have a polling place? What are the requirements for, for having a polling place, uh, for example, on your colony or reservation? There are certain uh, security criteria that, that are necessary to meet. Um, staffing criteria. Uh, wherever possible, um, the Secretary of State's office, again, worked very closely with the, the clerks and the tribes to make sure that those questions were answered and that all of those needs were met. Um, our office is, is very dedicated to increasing the, uh, the communication in both directions for Nevada's tribes and bands. Um, to that end, we have brought on uh, Mr. Cal Boone, who's here with me as our um, uh, uh, tribal outreach coordinator. Um, he is someone, he is working for us part-time right now. We hope to get him full-time after, uh, after he graduates. And actually, Cal, why don't I let you introduce yourself? Uh, good morning, Chair and the committee. Uh, my name is Cal Boone, uh, tribal outreach coordinator with the Secretary of State. Um, as Gabriel mentioned, I am still a student right now. I am wrapping up my degree in 
a political science with a dual minor in indigenous studies and ethnic studies. Um, I am a member of the Walker River Paiute tribe and coming into this role, I am ready to hit the ground running and help where I can. So really nice to meet you all. Thank you. Good Kyle. morning. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Gabriel DeCara for the record. So um, by, by bringing Cal on, by working within the, the parameters of this bill, by assisting the clerks however we can, um, we are trying to expand those relationships, um, to, to expand that uh, communication. It needs to be consistent and culturally competent, and we're really glad to have Cal on board. Um, there were some specific concerns, uh, again, around poll workers and some resource, resourcing that, that we can uh, address again in a minute. Um, but the uh, Secretary of State's office, at the direction of Secretary Aguilar, uh, did everything we could to ensure that um, these bills were followed in, in both the, the spirit and letter of the law. Um, I, th I think that was all I had on logistics, Mark, if we want to hand it back to you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Mark Velasquez, for the record. Uh, so, looking specifically uh, at slide seven now, and some of the details that that uh, regarding the, those collaborations over the last year uh, since the passage of the bill uh, up through the presidential preference primary. Uh, again, I think it's it's important to highlight first and foremost that that all seventeen of our counties do have historic tribal lands. Uh, that is something uh, again worthy of note uh, as it relates to the bill. Uh, but only thirteen of our current seventeen counties have present day tribal lands within their boundaries. Uh, those clerks, uh, again, I will tell you, having talked with all of them personally, take this very seriously. And, and again, we're, uh, I'm, I'm honored to have joining us today uh, Clerk Treasurer Rothy as well from uh, Churchill County, who, who will speak to us here in a moment about her experiences as well. Uh, you can see some of the details on the slide, though. I uh, won't read them necessarily to you, uh, verbatim, but just to highlight, again, nine of the, the counties did have tribal polling locations. Um, all 13 did offer. Uh, there was collaboration and continued discussion, which, which again, as, as Chief Kara mentioned, uh, I'm certain will continue to increase in the, the coming uh, months leading up to both the June and November primaries, as well as in preparation for the uh, 2026 election cycle that's right around the corner. Uh, I mentioned that we have a forum on the slide, uh, again, really just to highlight that, uh, you know, there's, there's a, some thought behind it. We want to make sure that it's not just necessarily verbal discussions, but that we're capturing and writing down, uh, which I think goes to also, which you are well aware that there's a, a high rate of turnover across our state when it comes to elections administrators. Uh, so having it written down is going to help ensure that there's a continuity in these, uh, these efforts to, to build relationships uh, so that they don't come and go with individuals. Um, Lastly, uh, again, there's a lot of discussion, too, about poll workers uh, and understanding the nature and, and requirements um, and, and certainly some encouragement, uh, not just for tribal members, but certainly you know, Nevadans across the board, <clears throat> 16 and up, are that are able to be poll workers. If there's any interest, uh, we certainly encourage it, and that was a, a, an important part of the discussion, too, having been a number, one of a, a specific limitations in a number of counties. Uh, but that being said, uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, Clerk Treasurer Rothery uh, from Churchill County, also in Carson City. Thank you very much, Deputy Walashen. Clerk Treasurer Rothery, thank you for joining us in Carson City. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, and good morning. My name is Linda Rothery. I'm the Churchill County Clerk Treasurer. And today I'd like to tell you a little bit about our tribe that we have in Churchill County. The Fallon Paiute Shoshone tribe is located is, lo um, is our local tribe and is located in Churchill County. On the reservation, the, the Community Learning Center became the polling place in 2022. At their administrative office, we provide a secure ballot drop box for voters to drop mail ballots off. A little history, in 2022, the tribe made application to set up a polling place on the reservation. At that time, we contacted member of the council and began those conversations. We met several times to um, establish a polling location. The 2022 general election was the first election that their community learning center, where it was held and it was successful and uh, we learned a lot at that time. In 2023, we started conversations for our 2024 election cycle and met with council and staff October 23, where we ironed out the particulars for that election cycle. The presidential preference primary was a success and we have moved on working for the primary election. Voter turnout had been minimal, has been minimal, however, 
it will increase and votes count. Both council and my office have recognized that there is a lack of voter outreach on the reservation. And with, with our combined efforts, we are gonna change that and make it better. Voter outreach is obviously key. And um, with the combined efforts, we're goal, our goal is to have um, more, more voter um, turnout. Tribal polling location turnout for the 2022, we had a total of 168 voters. And for the 2024 presidential preference primary, we had 33 voters. Mail ballot drop box utilized by voters was few, but we felt that members of the tribe would prefer to vote in person. Same day registration was key and it helped register and change at, uh, information on their applications so that they could vote. And then the lastly, I would like to you to know that members of council and staff on the reservation are wonderful and they are accommodating. We've made great strides in our communications and best efforts to make every election a success. So, you know, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Clerk Treasurer Rothery. Um, I have one question, then if any other members have questions, please uh, let me know. So Clerk Treasurer Rothery, in Churchill County, then for the presidential preference primary, was there a tribal polling location just for election day or also for early voting? Roth, Linda Rothery for the record. Um, early voting, we had one day of early voting and then we did election day for the presidential preference. Thank you. And in addition, there, the ballot drop box was on tribal land? And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, it was. It was at the administrative offices. Great. And what days was it available to voters the whole period of early voting or, what, or just on election day? When was the ballot drop box open? The ballot drop or available. box. Oh, excuse me. The ballot drop sorry. box was available um, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, because that's their hours at the administrative office. And uh, early voting was on the second or the first. We did one day of early voting on a Saturday um, for the presidential preference, and then we did election day. Thank you. Um, and then I guess I was wondering, how does that compare with past years in Churchill County in terms of, has it been similar in terms of the having an early voting location? on tribal land and an election day location, or do you think there was more access this year, or has it, uh, was it like this, you know, in past elections too that you've supervised? I gotta remember to turn the mic on, excuse me. Our first year was 2022 when we first started communicating with our tribe and made the um, general election the first election. So in comparison, we, what we did for the 2022 election was the one day of early voting on a Saturday, and then we did election day, and that's what we did for the presidential preference primary. We are in talks for the general, um, excuse me, the primary election, and uh, we found that if we did two Saturdays of early voting rather than the full election day, um, it would bring in more um, members of the tribe to come vote. And so that's what we're gonna attempt and try for the primary. And then from there, we're gonna have new discussions for the general election if we wanna change that. Thank you very much, Clerk Treasurer Rothery. Appreciate everything you're doing to uh, try to make uh, more access for tribal members to vote in Churchill County. And if I could follow up, I, I think with Deputy Walashin, and, I, and if you don't have this data right now, maybe you could provide the committee with it later, but that last slide, I think I think it was slide seven, that had the uh, information about 
um, nine counties had tribal polling locations and drop boxes for early voting for the presidential preference primary. All 13 counters, counties offered tribal polling locations and drop boxes on election day for the presidential preference primary. Um, I was just wondering, is, is there data as to how much was being offered in past elections on tribal lands in the different counties? If not, maybe that's something you could get to the committee now. So I don't expect you to have it now, but I'm just wondering if, if there is any, and if, if you do have it, could you share it with us? Thank you for the question, Chair Mark Velashen, for the record. Uh, absolutely, we'll get that information to the committee. Uh, we did post our tribal voting locations, including the hours, the drop boxes, early voting, and election day on our website, uh, the same location that we have all the other um, uh, tribal voting locations. And because we have the history of that over the last few election cycles, we'll be able to get that information to you very soon. Thank you. I sure appreciate it. Chairman. Members, any additional questions? Oh, oh yes. Uh, Chief Deputy Secretary of State, please, please jump in. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, apologies. Gabriel DeCara, for the record. Um, so I, I kind of want to highlight um, what we're talking about here in, in terms of data um, and to address the elephant in the room. Um, a number of tribes, not all of them, but a number of tribes first got access to a polling location on their reservation or colony uh, uh, by, by filing suit, right, by, by a court order. Um, now we have... Uh, clerks who are doing this work, who are conducting outreach, who are building these relationships. We have legislation that is uh, set up to help facilitate this communication and um, you know, advance the, the civil rights of, of tribal members living in Nevada. Um, but that's still new. Uh, it, it, is still, it is still recent. Um, uh, if I had never had a, an in-person polling place in my neighborhood, uh, and was not particularly familiar with the elections calendar, the first time one popped up, I would uh, myself be uh, I interested. Um, but there's an educational component here as well, and not just education in terms of, um, in terms of about uh, you know, when elections are in election law, et cetera. Um, there is a, a, a need to partner with the community, to build relationships with community. Again, that, that's why I'm, I'm very grateful to um, have Cal to, to start uh, building those relationships between tribes and the clerks and tribes in the state. Um, but I just want to... Um, uh, say to this committee that, that just because the numbers, they, they may be lower than, than we would think or we would hope for, that's because this is still an incredibly new process. Um, and uh, we need to make sure that we are continually investing both our time and our resources into expanding this access, into working with these communities, uh, in hopes that we will, will see uh, further participation later down the line. Um, but by no means are, are we at the state uh, or the, the folks that we've discussed this with in the county, by no means are we discouraged. Well, I sure appreciate all the secretaries and chief deputy and deputy secretaries' efforts, all the clerks' treasures, to try to remove barriers for tribal members to vote. And I hope that we never have to see uh, tribes have to file lawsuits to try to get that right again. I appreciate everything you've done to try to make sure that uh, you know voting is as easy uh, on tribal lands as um, in you know urban neighborhoods in Las Vegas or Reno. So thank you very much. Members, any additional questions for Clerk Treasurer Rothery, Deputy Secretary Woloshin, uh, Chief Deputy DeGuerra, or our, our tribal liaison? Uh, in Carson City, Senator Daly, any questions? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. And for our members online, any questions? Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Clerk Treasurer, Chief Deputy, and Deputy Secretary Walsh, and thank you so much. With that, I am now going Chairman, to- Chairman, apologies go at the oh, risk yes. of overstaying my welcome at the table. Uh, Gabriel DeCare, for the record. Um, there, there was one other item uh, around, again, the logistics of this that I just wanted to go over. Um, this, uh, this bill, um, these bills, although they, they uh, do, again, further the, the civil rights that, that should be supported, um, they are also something of an unfunded mandate for counties, um, especially counties that have uh, tribes in very remote locations. Um, 
it, it is a, a best practice if you can't find a, a community member, for example, um, to stay up at a, a, a remote location like Fort McDermott um, to when you send poll workers to also provide for their uh, food and lodging so that they can work the polls and not have to drive a, a couple hours back down to Winnemucca at the end of the day. Um, the Secretary of State's office, we have done everything we can to support the counties. Again, this is not me saying that it's expensive, so it should not be done. Uh, it, it is the law. It is the right of, of those citizens to have um, a polling place in their community. Uh, but there is also the, the, the reality that, that that costs money um, and, and that comes with expenses. Uh, there were, I, I think, some fiscal notes that were uh, removed from these bills, but I, I just want to um, highlight to this community uh, committee, if you see the counties asking for additional resources um, related to this, know that it's because uh, this, this does have a material cost for the counties, and that is not an attempt to uh, in any way undermine the legislation. I, I just wanted to make sure that that was on the record as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Chief Deputy Secretary of State. Thank you. I appreciate you putting that on the record because I think you're absolutely right, and I think um, a lot of uh, there is a lot of logistics going to place, especially with more remote locations. So that's something I think we'll have to just uh, keep an eye on and maybe you know look at either in the interim or upcoming session. So with that, I now would like to move on to agenda item number four A, where we are very very lucky today to have elected government leaders from some of our tribal nations here in, within Nevada and other representatives from the tribal community. And I believe that we have uh, Vice Chair Arnold Thomas of the Shoshone Paiute Tribe of Duck Valley Indian Reservation on Zoom. We have Chair Andrea Martinez and Elveta Martinez of the Walker River Paiute Tribe on Zoom. And then we have Bethany Sam Public Relations and Community Information Officer for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony at the Legislative Building in Carson City. So I um, would like to open it up to whoever would like to begin, whether you're on Zoom or Carson City, and um, please state your name for the record. Proceed. Thank you for joining us today. Um, good morning. I'll go first if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. Good morning, go ahead. committee members. Oh. Alvita Martinez, I'm with the Walker Bayou Tribe. Um, apologies, our chairman is in another state meet, meeting right now that is actually being held here on our reservation, the Public Lands Committee meeting. So she won't be here this morning. Um, Alvita Martinez, a member of the Walker River Paiute Tribe. I've been voting on our reservation since I was 18. We've always had a precinct location here and I just turned 65. So it's been a norm here for our people to vote here. In 2016, we were one of the tribes that filed a lawsuit against the county and the Secretary of State, along with the Primal Lake Paiute tribe. And our part of that lawsuit was just for early voting. So um, we're happy that, you know, we won the lawsuit. I, re I really did my best to let Mineral County know that we were gonna win, you know, and um, there was still a little battle, but we, Ended up after all of that was said and done, we ended up having a really good working relationship um, with our county clerk and the people in Mineral County. Um, so right now, our big thing again was the early voting. And over the past year, since 2016, when we get early voting, we've always gotten the same days and times as Mineral County or Hawthorne did. So um, recently, in the last couple of years, though, we got a new county clerk that, you know, right off the bat, we kind of had a little little issue because she didn't want to give us the times, the same times of early voting as they did in Hawthorne. So I had to kind of educate her to, to let her know that, no, we're, we're going to be voting the same dates and times as you are. Um, Anyway, she wanted to wanted to argue. We had a problem. They wouldn't put the information on the, you know, the sample ballot that went out. It was wrong. We ended up having to contact the Secretary of State's office, or she did. It got fixed. But now we actually have a really good working relationship with her. She didn't know. She just wasn't educated from by the past county clerk that had left 
left Hawthorne and left the state. So, you know, I kind of let her know that this is what we, we've done. We've had these meetings, you know, previously, we had a really good working relationship, but now we, we do again with, um, with Monroe County. What they do is, you know, she thought it was gonna be a lot of extra work for her, but over all these years, you know, we've always provided poll workers on the reservation from our own tribal people. So it's a, it's been a norm for that as well. You know, in my, my many years, I've been a poll worker, I've been the deputy working in the polls. So um, it's, not, it's nothing new for our tribal people. So now when our county clerk contacts the tribe, she'll actually call me and said, Alvita, who do you got? I'll give her four names. She contacts them, they get trained. Um, during any vo early voting or voting day, two people work the polls here, but we have four people trained so they can, um, you know, they can work at different times. But one of the, one of the um, poll workers does the scheduling and, um, you know, we just, we set up a place that is secure. Um, this last, last voting, we just had the, um, the one in what, a couple of months ago. We had it in an old, it's our old tribal court building because our court people moved to a new building. So we'll be there for the next couple of voting um, this year. But what we saw when we started the early voting here is our numbers did go up. We are already the second largest precinct in Mineral County. You know, Mineral County is not the largest county whatsoever. And I would say Mineral County is probably the poorest county in the state. So um, that's one thing Mineral County didn't ever complain about is the extra cost. You know, so in counties, training of the people, well, they've always done that anyway. Um, there wasn't, to me, that much a big of an expense, you know. We had the more days for the early voting. Um, I hate to say after a while, the county clerks always ended up, they were like coming down here every day. They just kind of liked the vibe, I guess. Um, and that's one, one of the other things is when you had our own tribal polling people, workers, people are more likely to come and vote. They're more comfortable. Everybody knows each other. Um, they know what to expect. And, you know, again, like I've been involved in this for many years with our tribe and with other tribes. And I've been involved in even the state legislature and, you know, working on these bills because, to me, it's important. You know, the Native people were the last group of people to get the right to vote, you know, and um, our, we kind of grew up with that mentality that as soon as you turn 18, you go and vote. So we always knew that that's what we should do. So um, we, all, we always vote. Our families are voters here. And it's almost like we don't have to really push them anymore because it's a norm. You know, again, I think because we've always educated our people that there was, you know, and it wasn't that long ago that the Native people had to fight to the, for the right to vote. Um, so, again, when we did the lawsuit in 2016, it was the veterans, uh, Vietnam veterans that led that charge. And from here, it was Johnny Williams Jr., um, a, a veteran of the Vietnam War that had been wounded. So we're really proud of him. The other thing that I, I really am so happy about now is, you know, once these bills passed, we we're always saying, how do we how do we get that information out to the tribes? Because I knew it was gonna end up being the native people that had to let the other tribes know about it. I personally contacted the tribes close to me, which is Yarrington and Fallon and talked to different people and I told them they were like actually kind of scared. I don't know, do it, just get started. You know, we'll help you guys and find people that wanna um, work the polls. They pay you a little bit of money. It's, you know, not gonna get rich, but you're gonna be there and you're gonna learn about the process and you're gonna learn to get involved. But our other thing, again, with the native people getting to vote, um, our, late, our next thing is education wise. And Kel's, Kel's aware of this very much is that once you become a voter and you become a part of the process, then we are part of this whole legislative process where we can change laws. 
we can really work to change laws and that's what we've done. And um, anytime we're working, you know, with the Secretary of State's office to make these other changes, SB 216 and 327, you know, it's um, it's going to help. And then, you know, we're always thinking, well, what, what do we need next? And of course, um, just like the Secretary of State's office mentioned, you know, there is a need for money. You know, a lot of these were unfunded mandates or laws, but there is a need for money to make it better. You know, again, the county clerk knows that from Fallon. You know, it's a little extra time, her time. You know, a lot of times you need more machines. You need more drop boxes. You needed all of those things at the beginning when you just started as a, a new county, starting a new precinct location. Um, one of the things that, that, let's see, I was reading, reading the notes and one of the things was what, what can we do to improve to make the voting process even better um, on Indian lands? And again, I just have to, you know, I'm always trying to tell our tribal people, be proactive in this process. Quit waiting for the county clerks to contact you. You contact them, establish a relationship. Because like I said, we had a little issue there with our new county clerk and she says, why do we need to do this? I said, because I'm telling everybody how great you are, how you're supporting us and how this voting is so important. And she said, oh, okay. And now, now it's just like, you know, we're, we're friends. We're like on first name basis. So it's like we too as tribal people need to take initiative and, you know, really work to um, establish positive relationships um, with our county clerks and the secretary of state office and, um, you know, it's it's getting better. I just have to say it's getting better. Um, during voting time, this this last little voting we had was very, you know, very minimal on voters. Um, and it's just the way the system is this year where, you know, there was the voting or then the Republicans had to do their caucus. And uh, again, our tribal people, in order to be involved in their Republican caucus, they still had to travel to Hawthorne to go and and do that. And I think we only had a couple people go and do that, even though we probably have 40% um, Republican voters here on our reservation. <clears throat> so that was a that was kind of a different and a little um, different for them. Um, when I push for our people to vote, I never tell them how to vote any way in their party or whatever. I just want them to vote. Um, I would love to tell them who to vote for, but I don't do that. Um, but anyway, I think um, we just need to keep it up. I hope Cal's position could be a position that would be full-time. Um, I'm very proud of Cal. He is a member of our tribe, you know, from Las Vegas. He's already contacted our tribal chairman, Andrea Martinez. So um, again, he's establishing relationships out there and and that's what we need to do. And I think that's about all I have other than, you know what, we just all need to continue on this path of um, working on voting rights. And um, like I said, since the native people were the last last people to be, have this right to vote, to me, it's very important. And we just need to, to keep on and um, keep working with other tribes. And we're always, you know, if it was up to me, I would make it a, like every tribe have have the full, you know, I know like Arrington, they just wanted the drop box, but I wish everybody would just get involved in it because um, it's actually, we look forward to it. Our people down here really look forward to it. And then we all keep in touch with each other, like me and Pyramid Lake, we're always checking on how many voters did you get today? What are you guys doing? You know, what, what are you, what are your ideas? How is your relationship with the Washington County clerk? You know, and it's just like, well, we're doing this and we're doing that. So we're kind of all learning from each other through this whole process. And um, like I said, I think with the, like Kel's job, he's going to learn that more how, you know, there's this, this communication line with the tribes. We just need to grow it out more and, um, Again, thank you, and um, I apologize 
that our chairman's not available today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Martinez, for your presentation. And uh, it's great to see so, so uh, much activism from members of the Walker River Paiute Tribe. Just a personal note, I had the real privilege of serving in the assembly under uh, Speaker Asagara, who's an enrolled member of the Walker River Paiute Tribe, and I believe might be, uh, might be one of our only Native American speakers of the Nevada Assembly. So that was a real honor, getting to serve under him and uh, having that tribal representation when he led uh, our, our assembly chamber. A couple of questions I had, Ms. Martinez, just uh, do you know for the presidential preference primary, was there uh, in-person voting for early voting or just on election day? And was there a ballot drop box? And what days was early voting available if they had it? And what days was the drop box available uh, on the Walker River Pi tribal lands? We had early voting, um, the same as Mineral County. So we almost had like it's called like two weeks and then uh, one or two Saturdays, the same as Mineral County and as well as on voting day. And during that time, we had a drop box here the whole time. No, we Thank get everything. You. We, get every, I, we, want, we want it all and we, we get it all. Thank you. And then one question based on something you brought up. You mentioned that a lot of tribal members on the Walker River Paiute Tribe felt more comfortable when other tribal members were uh, being, um, you know, election officials for early voting and or election day voting. So was that was that a struggle to try to make sure that there were tribal members who were working, you know, at the polling places to sign people in? Or was that something that the election administration in Mineral County, you felt wanted tribal members to to be working those polling places for early voting and for election day? Well, we've always had um, tribal poll workers, but back probably 20 years ago, they used to always send down a non, non Indian to, to come and watch us. It was, it'd be kind of funny because it would be like, they wouldn't let us have all tribal um, poll workers. They would always have to send down a non Indian to, to be involved. But, and you know, probably in the last 15 years, all of our poll workers are all from Walker River and they're all native. Oh, we, we've had a couple because we have non-natives that live here as well. So, um, but for the last five years, they've been all members of the Walker River Paiute tribe. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, members, any questions here from members, from uh, Ms. Martinez? Uh, Senator Daly in Carson City, any questions? For Ms. Martinez from the Walker River Paiute Tribe? No, no questions for me, but you do have the uh, deputy uh, wants to make a comment up here. Oh, certainly. Uh, uh, deputy, please go ahead, and then I'll get to the members on Zoom. Chief Deputy, please uh, proceed. Thank you very much, Senator Daly. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Chairman. Gabriel DeCara for the record. I just wanted to um, echo Ms. Martinez's comments. I was uh, I made some some stops at early voting locations uh, across the state. Um, one of the places I stopped was was Schur's, and I stopped by their uh, their early voting location and and uh, sat and had a, a chat with the the poll workers. Uh, it was great. There's a sign right out there on the side of the road that says, "Hey, come vote here." Uh, super, super inviting, um, uh, and, and was able to, to speak with the, the chairman as well. Um, I, I think that it is absolutely fair to say that the Walker River Paiute tribe um, is the, kind of a best practice in terms of um, how the, the, the model can work on a, a, a reservation or colony. Um, one thing that I wanted to add is that to that concern about um, having poll workers and especially being able to um, identify poll workers from these tribal communities to work on polling locations. Um, it, is, it is not always easy due to the size of the community, due to other uh, uh, job uh, requirements, right? Uh, it, you can't work as a poll worker while you are needing to do your other job. Um, it, again, there are also uh, have been some issues with getting um, staff from or, or poll workers from uh, non-tribal communities to, to go work in those locations, mostly due to the remote nature of, of several of them. Uh, but 
you know, again, obviously it's a, it's a best practice to have tribal members um, working in their communities. I will say that in this last, uh, in the presidential preference primary, um, uh, the Secretary of State's office um, stepped in and, and sent a number of uh, staff uh, of, from, from our office to go staff to uh, remote polling locations. Um, we did this because it was the right thing to do. It was Secretary Aguilar's direction to ensure that those tribal polling locations stay open as long as the tribe wants them by any means necessary. Um, and, and that's what we did. Uh, our hope is that through continued community outreach, again, through uh, the, the work of our outreach coordinator, Mr. Boone, um, that we will be able to uh, grow that, that roster of, of uh, members of these tribes and bands who are interested in being poll workers. Uh, and we can, uh, um, you know, expand the, 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 the universe of, of poll workers in those communities. I, I just wanted to add that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Deputy DeGuerre, and thank you to Secretary Aguilar and the entire office to make that sacrifice to send out employees who may not be, uh, you know, scheduled to be manning precincts in remote places to, to travel. Uh, to those places so that people can vote. That is truly wonderful to hear. And thank you for that to the, to the office and to those employees. Um, members on Zoom, any questions from, no, my, from members? There. No, no. No. Okay. Thank you. And then I guess I thought of one last question, uh, Ms. Martinez. And I'm, I just wonder the litigation in 2016 that you brought up. Do you think with the changes in the law now and the state law that there'll be need for litigation in the future? Or do you think that right now, uh, tribal voting on the Walker River Paiute tribal lands secure enough, or do you think that's going to be an unknown just to? Well, I think you're going to hear that from Mr. Thomas because they had to file a lawsuit recently. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to go on Zoom to our next presenter, we're so lucky to have Vice Chair Arnold Thomas of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of Duck Valley Indian Reservation. Thank you, Vice Chair Thomas, for joining us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you, Vice Chair Thomas. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us today. Uh, yeah, for the record, uh, Arnold Thomas, uh, Vice Chairman of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of Duck Valley, uh, to uh, Senator Ornshaw and your committee, uh, as well as Secretary of State's office and uh, Chairwoman uh, from Walker River and all those uh, others that are on virtual uh, and listening. Uh, good morning to you all and uh, Aloha Friday. So, um, Yes, so I would like to uh, clarify uh, several items uh, for uh, uh, for Gabriel and his office. Uh, again, thank you for all your work in the last year to support uh, our uh, our uh, voting booth here, uh, because there was uh, two uh, state employees that were sent here. So again, thank you. And we have been in dialogue and communication with uh, SOS office uh, here in the last year. So what I would like to clarify is uh, regarding the notification that was sent out. So there's 28 uh, tribal nations uh, in Nevada. So we here in Duck Valley are, we're a sovereign nation. We're a fully functional, uh, tribal government. So uh, for future reference, a proper notification needs to be uh, sent uh, to our uh, tribal uh, headquarters office uh, via chairman and council. Uh, so I, I mentioned that because we are elected leaders. We have a chairman, uh, which he's in another meeting. So we have a chairman that's elected. Also, we have six other elected uh, council uh, in uh, seats that are filled by men and women. And so I make reference to that because we're, we're not a nonprofit organization. Uh, our tribal leaders are leaders of our nation here in Duck Valley. Uh, I cannot speak for the other 27 tribes of Nevada, uh, but I want to offer clarification because in Ve Las Vegas, uh, in other metropolitan areas, uh, possibly Reno, 
you have uh, tribal leaders that are tribal leaders of a community or within an urban setting. Uh, you know, they could be leaders of a nonprofit organization. But again, uh, we we here in Duck Valley, we are elected officials uh, similar to uh, senators, assembly, men and women. So this sort of clarification moving forward, that proper uh, notification needs to be made to our uh, tribal headquarters uh, and chairman's office uh, regarding any and all voting issues. Uh, so that that's the first uh, clarification that needs to be made uh, on the behalf of our sovereign nation here in Duck Valley. Um, so thank, like thank you, Vice Chair Thomas. Thank you. Yeah. So I would like to uh, move on uh, down the list uh, regarding the, the bills uh, that we uh, testified on. Uh, again, uh, the law, which is the law, <laughs> black and white. And so I, I really appreciate the efforts that uh, SOS office has made, uh, ensuring that our lawsuit uh, back in 2020, uh, 2021, 2022, uh, that uh, within the lawsuit and the law that uh, we had full uh, voting day similar to Elko County. Uh, there's still some uh, issues that we were dealing with here uh, in January. And I'm really, uh, again, uh, appreciative of uh, SOS office to uh, uh, return calls and be in communication with uh, us here in Duck Valley regarding ensuring that the voting booth was staffed. Uh, so part of the issue was, uh, number one, uh, because we're a small uh, community, uh, there was an issue with back in 2022 when we had the voting booth there. There was an issue with some of the workers receiving payment in, in a timely manner per federal and state laws. So given a small community, a tribal community, uh, that specific uh, word was placed out into the community that one of the workers did not receive their payment uh, in a timely manner. So that had an impact on uh, staffing the, the booth here in January. Uh, and, and again, uh, Secretary of State's office was notified uh, per law, uh, and, and per, per uh, discussion with uh, Gabriel and his staff, uh, they sent two workers up to assist us. And I appreciate the data that has been presented because uh, in January, the numbers were low. And it, I'm excited uh, hearing from Walker River that the numbers will increase as we continue uh, dialogue and uh, efforts to uh, get more uh, tribal members and community members to the voting booth. Uh, the other aspect in 2022, uh, we had an issue with the drop box, uh, with, with the voting box. Once the elections were completed, we could not uh, get Elko County to uh, provide a law enforcement officer to transport uh, that particular voting box back to Elko County. Uh, and again, with the support of uh, Four Directions, uh, the nonprofit uh, who assisted us in the lawsuit, uh, we reached out to uh, the SOS office. Uh, after some discussion, uh, from my understanding, the State Highway Patrol uh, was, uh, they traveled here to transport the voting boxes with all the ballots back to Elko County. Uh, so, Hopefully, uh, you know, there's been some additional discussion with SOS's office regarding uh, future transportation of those boxes. Uh, I know the other aspect which we were in discussion with and that's in the bill is the online voting, ease. Uh, it's awesome. We were working to be the pilot uh, tribal nation because we're so remote. Uh, you know, we're 100 miles north of Elko. We're, we're right on the Idaho-Nevada border. So that was that was an awesome effort. 
but at the end of the day, uh, the E system, because of, because of our remote location and our access to reliable broadband connectivity, uh, some of our tribal members and community members were concerned regarding that system being used effectively, uh, again, because of where we're located. Uh, and, but that's another issue we're working on with the state, state of Nevada regarding broadband uh, connectivity for our new school campus. Uh, also, we, we were able to use uh, our elected uh, tribal enrollment uh, uh, committee members to validate tribal IDs uh, here uh, for those tribal members who live in Nevada uh, compared to those tribal members who live in Idaho. So that process went really well in 2022, and we uh, look forward to continue uh, success in that area of validating uh, the utilization of tribal identification cards. Uh, so I, I just want to mention a, a few items there uh, that were in, in the bill that were referenced earlier by, uh, by Mr. Valashin uh, in the SOS office. Uh, I know some discussion occurred regarding uh, jury duty. And we were told back here last year, once the bills were approved, we would have continued discussion. And uh, jury duty for our tribal members, uh, when, uh, when, when they're requested, they would have to travel to Elko, which is uh, the similar situation that we addressed in our lawsuit regarding a good hour, hour and a half commute to Elko, uh, and I know uh, Gabriel and his office were making efforts to address that issue to make an exemption regarding jury duty and haven't heard an update on that yet. So uh, for now, uh, Senator Orenfeld, I just want to uh, make those comments. Thank you. Vice Chair Thomas, thank you very much for everything you're doing for your tribal members to make sure they have access to voting. I appreciate your efforts during the session when you came and you you testified and you spoke to legislators about the importance of these bills and trying to avoid the kind of litigation that uh, you had to pursue and in the past. Uh, I'm just wondering, with the recent changes in the law, you mentioned uh, tribal ID and the changes there, and then with uh, the, the legislation here that we've talked about, 216 and 327, uh, do you feel like it has improved access for your tribal members in terms of being able to vote with With, you, with utilizing the tribal identification cards, yes, uh, 2022, we, we, we had uh, a good number of tribal members uh, uh, come to vote. Uh, but then here in January, uh, there was a minimal uh, voter turnout. But uh, yes, our tribal membership is the first time ever <laughs> that uh, voting uh, has occurred here, similar to what uh, our uh, elected leader from Walker River mentioned. And, and so it was very historical, very awesome that uh, uh, individuals did not have to uh, travel very far to uh, come and use their tribal identification cards to vote. So yes, it, it, it did work uh, very efficiently. Thank you very much. And then you mentioned the issue with transporting ballot boxes and needing the law enforcement that Highway Patrol stepped in, or down, I guess Nevada State Police, um, in the past were were, any, were efforts made at other law enforcement trying to to help transport those, and what do you envision for the future in terms of trying to transport those ballot boxes? So here within uh, our uh, within our tribal nation here in Duck Valley, we had the Bureau of Indian Affairs law enforcement which is a branch of the Department of Interior. Uh, and we were, it was explained from the chief of the law enforcement that the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, officers uh, did not have or, or were not able to transport those ballot boxes back to Elko. And that was not their responsibility. So uh, I'd like to hear from uh, the SOS office uh, on how we can uh, move forward. 
Uh, Thank you, Vice Chair Thomas. Oh, uh, Chief Deputy Deguerra, please proceed. Uh, Thank you, Chairman Orman. Orenshaw, uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Thomas, Gabriel DeCara for the record. Uh, so the Secretary of State's office is having conversations, uh, as, as some folks, I, I know there was a, a quite a bit of conversation about it last session, but for, for anyone tuning in who may not be aware, um, Owyhee, where the, the Duck Valley Reservation is, um, is a, a, a good hour and a half, two hours, depending on how carefully you have to drive uh, from, from Elko through some uh, particularly tight valleys that uh, I would not look forward to driving at night, let's say, um, uh, especially not uh, you know a cold winter night in November after polls close. So there are some, there are some safety concerns. Um, I want to get this on the record every chance I can because uh, uh, voting machines are not connected to the internet in order for those votes to be tabulated on election night. Uh, you must physically drive the, the, the tabulation, um, uh, little, little flash drives, you mu- and, and the ballots, of course, you must physically drive them back to the, the uh, county clerk's office for those ballots to be tabulated. Um, and again, there, there can be safety concerns. Uh, we've had an early conversation uh, with uh, the, the state police in case something like that is necessary. Uh, frankly, our, our hope is not to do that. Um, we've also spoke with folks from the uh, Department of Transportation. Um, obviously, uh, we follow the county's lead whenever and wherever possible. The county clerks work something out with, uh, with her office, uh, the Elko sheriffs, et cetera. Um, that's, that's great. But if the state needs to provide support and we can get, um, you know, potentially an dot driver or, uh, you know, someone else, potentially even someone from the secretary of state's office to provide that assistance. Um, that's, that's what we'll do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief Deputy DeGuerra. Appreciate all your efforts to try to uh, ensure access to the Vice Chair Thomas's tribal members and, and make sure that they can participate. Thank you for everything you've done and, and that I know that you and the Secretary are doing. Uh, members, any additional questions for Vice Chair Arnold Thomas of the Shoshone Paiute Tribes of the Duck Valley Indian Reservations? You don't see any here at the Sawyer Building. Senator Daly up in Carson City. Uh, no, no, thank you, Chair. But uh, would, would clarify for the record that November is not winter; doesn't start till mid-December. Just, just giving them a hard time. <laughs> thank you, Senator Daly. Thank you. And members on Zoom, any questions? No, thanks, Chair. No, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Thomas, for joining us today. Thank you. And. Up at the Legislative Building in Carson City, we are very lucky to have Bethany Sam, Public Relations and Community Information Officer for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Thank you for joining us today. Sorry. Manahu ha'a inat niat Bethany Sam, na kovelweta, na kutzetika, na Dakota, na washu, na tsapani. Uh, thank you, uh, committee, for inviting me to speak today on behalf of um, tribal elections and our polling locations. Um, my name is Bethany Sam. I'm the public information officer for Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Um, I am also an advocate for Native Vote and have worked uh, with uh, Reno Sparks Indian Colony since 2019 and have been a part of the new uh, legislative processes and conversations. And um, I'm, and just to put it on record, I am a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, uh, but I did grow up in the um, Great Basin area. I'm originally from Colville, California, but I was born here in Carson City uh, because this is the closest town to uh, Colville, California. Um, I would like to uh, say that uh, you know this year, June 2nd, marks 100 years that Native Americans are official citizens of the United States, which is a little um, ironic because we've been here before everyone else. And so, um, you know, that's a, a, something that needs to be noted um, in how new uh, elections are for our communities. Um, 
every state or um, every nations and every state uh, continue to fight uh, for against barriers uh, regarding tribal elections. Uh, Reno Sparks Indian Colony uh, had their first polling locations in 2018 due to the discrimination case in 2016. Um, and uh, right now we have, uh, for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony specifically, there are 13 or 1,331 tribal members um, for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. And uh, we have 863 eligible voters who are 18 and older. Um, of that 863, there's about a little over 650 that live in, the, uh, live in Nevada and um, are eligible voters. Um, in Washoe County, we have about 10,000 Native Americans living within the county and uh, definitely uh, used Reno Sparks Indian Colony for services. Um, I, I know it was mentioned earlier about any acts that or uh, bills that may be passed and um, right now we're working with uh, the National Congress of American Indians on voting act or voting rights acts um, and they are being varied state by state and I believe New Mexico had passed their first um, NAVRA in 2023 or last year. Um, we do deal with that a lot um, and I can say for our um, polling locations uh, every so often a uh, tribal member will be turned away due to their tribal IDs and uh, not or they're not familiar with the uh, tribal ID or the poll workers aren't. Um, at Reno Sparks Indian Colony we have um, we have offered uh, the early early voting both for uh, primary or the PPPs, the pre presidential preference primary. Uh, we'll have them for June primary and also general elections. Uh, we offer drop off boxes um, and um, uh, you know, it, it is necessary uh, for um, you know, the drop-off box boxes to be located at our tribal uh, reservation uh, just because we have a lot of elders and uh, different factors that tribal members can't get to the polling locations and um, their family members are able to drop those off for them. Um, just to mention some of the barriers, I know um, uh, we're, the committee is looking for uh, ways to improve um, improve voting turnout for native communities. Um, we have uh, some common reasons for low native Native American voter turnout uh, would be our ge geographic isolation, um, often with a lack of reliable transportation and poor access to distant polling and registration locations, non-traditional mailing address addresses, overcrowded housing, homelessness, and housing instability lack of residential mail delivery and limited access to post, office, post offices, lack of access to affordable and reliable broadband service, um, native language translation uh, needs including non-written uh, during the voting processes, uh, strong socioeconomic challenges such as poverty and unemployment, uh, historic and ongoing mistrust of state and local governments. Um, also, um, you know, we we are very proud and happy of the new bills that have been uh, passed uh, for uh, tribal polling locations and uh, effective communication um, through SB 3, 327, uh, where every tribal nation will receive a, a receive a polling place if desired by the tribal nations and using the opting out services. Um, and SB 216, uh, which requires the county clerks to effectively communicate with tribal nations and the ease expansion. Um, I know at our uh, facilities, uh, the ease wasn't used, um, and I think it was just because it was so new, we really didn't have a gem demonstration of the process, and um, I think there was also issues using the, our tribal IDs. Um, like I said, every, every nation has their own um, identification cards, um, including mine from Standing Rock, and it does have all of our information on there, but I think um, because they're so all over the place, I think it makes it harder and harder for um, the, uh, whoever's approving them uh, to push them through. Um, and like I said, it's so new, we, d we really haven't had a chance to 
teach our tribal members how to do that. Um, <clears throat> communication, uh, definitely we're at Reno Sparks Indian Colony, we are very um, grateful to Washoe County. Uh, they are in constant communication with us. I believe at the time Jamie Rodriguez came out um, early August. We had a meeting. We did a walkthrough. Uh, she, uh, you know, was very accommodating to the needs of the tribal community, um, including hours of operation, knowing which dates were going to be open. Um, we have three polling locations. Uh, one is at our uh, at the Reno Colony itself, it's uh, either at our, our gym facility or our multi-purpose rooms where our, our tribal headquarters are at. Um, we have our smoke shop six in Spanish Springs that's open to the public and also um, in Hungry Valley where it's a more rural for our tribal communities to, to be at. Um, at Reno Sparks Indian Colony, we are fortunate because we are right next to the city. Um, however, for other tribes, we know that is a, a, an issue of uh, communication. Um, and I'm not sure if it's just because, you know, it's still so new of um, um, tribal or having tribal polling locations. And I know it kind of stretches uh, people thin, uh, but it is important because uh, our voice matters. Um, also, um, you know, data is an issue. Um, I know uh, working with the Democratic Victory Outreach, uh, when, you know, it says American Indian on the, um, you know, when you're recognizing your ethnicity. And a lot of times we have, uh, you know, we're the American Indians, but there's also the uh, India Indians and also um, indigenous peoples that are coming up from Mexico and South America, and they identify themselves as American Indian or indigenous and are filling that out. And so I know our data is uh, really convoluted with, uh, you know, extra uh, people who are really not Native American. And uh, we don't think that's a bad thing. It's just uh, our data gets mixed up in, be in between all of the um, other data. Um, and, and it's our duty to serve all tribal members, so we appreciate all the efforts of uh, trying to accommodate our needs, but it is new uh, for our tribal nations to even think about voting. Um, I honestly, um, you know, my, my grandpa is a Korean War veteran or was a Korean War veteran. He's very involved with politics, so was my uh, grandmother, but I always depended on them to take care of the politics side. Um, and I actually didn't vote until 2016 myself. And, um, you know, and that's just because, uh, you know, the, the relationship that we have with the state, we're not really sure where we're at with, um, you know, uh, Native Americans and, and politics and, um, you know, with the efforts of the administrations now in the state, uh, we have more and more tribal members uh, looking to, um, are wanting to participate and be in, more involved because we're understanding this is how we're heard, how our voices are heard at a, at a higher level. Um, and so um, I'd just like to thank you and that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sam. Appreciate all your efforts to try to make sure that the tribal members of the, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony uh, don't have barriers in front of them to be able to, to vote and to participate. Uh, one question I have, you mentioned the three voting sites uh, for the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. In terms of the days and times that were available for in-person voting, uh, during early voting, election day voting, and mail ballot drop boxes, do you know those times? Were they comparable to what the rest of uh, voters had outside of the, the colony? And if you don't know now, maybe we could get the information later. I'm just wondering, you know, were the, was the same access available for tribal members in terms of times that they could vote early, vote on election day, and drop their ballot to a drop box? Uh, yes. Um, in 2020, we were the same as everyone else, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, this last pre presidential preference primary, we kind of limited it, knowing uh, certain days were slower than others, and I believe uh, we uh, did 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on certain days uh, for our specific polling locations. Thank you very much, Ms. Sam. Members, any additional questions for Ms. Sam from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, the Public Relations and Community Information Officer? 
up in Carson City or on Zoom, members? No, I don't, I don't see any questions. Thank you very much for joining us, Ms. Sam. We really appreciate uh, the information that you've provided. Thank you, Pajat you. Thank you so much. With that, members, we are going now to uh, letter C. We have a presentation from Katie Owens Hubler, Project Manager at the National Conference of State Legislatures. And we're very lucky to have Ms. Owens Hubler. Thank you so much for joining us and for your patience today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'll just pull up my presentation. Okay, are we able to see that? Uh, you know, I can. we can see you on Zoom right now. I'm not seeing the presentation or the PowerPoint. So we may have a technical okay. difficulty up here in Carson City. Oh, thank you, Deputy Walashen. Now, now I can, thank you so much. Now I can see it. Great, thank you for confirming. Oh, now it went, now it went away. Okay. Wait, now we can see it. Okay, yes, we can see we it. it. Thank you. We yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Walsh, and thank you, Ms. Owens Hubler. Okay, great. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Katie Owens Hubler. I'm with the National Conference of State Legislatures. I study election policies nationwide. I'm here to speak a bit about state policies for voting by members of tribal nations. Um, so, going to take us to the sort of national perspective on this topic for a bit. Uh, today, I'll be speaking a little bit about NCSL, what we do, and some of the services we provide. I'll also be covering recent legislation from around the country on this topic, and just note a few other things that states are doing. Um, I will note that it's been really great to hear about everything that Nevada has been doing on this topic over the last hour. Uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures, I hope you're all um, aware of us and have interacted with us a bit in the past. Um, we are the nation's bipartisan organization supporting the legislatures, also legislative staff. We provide connections between different legislators from other states. We have a variety of meetings. Um, we have our big meeting, the Legislative Summit, coming up in August, and that is in Louisville, Kentucky. We also provide a variety of policy research on um, every, any topic you can imagine. I again focus on elections. So if there's anything here that you hear that you'd like me to dig a, deep, a little bit deeper into, anything else you'd like to know, um, I love election policy. I can talk about it all day long. Um, I also have colleagues from around the organization who can address any other policy needs that you have. Uh, I'd also like to highlight one of the caucuses that we have at NCSL. We have the National Caucus of Native American State Legislators. Um, this is a group that has 89 members from 21 states focusing on Native American policy issues and an opportunity for them to network and discuss the unique needs of this community. So I do want to offer to the committee if there's ever a time that you would like to have someone from this organization or one of our staffers from NCSL who staffs this organization speak with you, um, I'm happy to make that connection. Okay, so, so we've heard a lot about the topics in Nevada that have been, been an issue for members of tribal nations. Um, there are some trends on this nationwide. I do want to say that you in Nevada have been a leader on this. You have more legislation that's been introduced on this particular topic for helping to facilitate voting for tribal members than most other states. Uh, there are a number of states that have legislation going on this topic. I've looked back to about 2017 for most of my research on this particular topic. The reason for that being that before that, there actually was not much. Um, here at NCSL, we track legislation going back to 2001 in the elections space. And from about 2011 to 2016, and even prior to that, there really wasn't much on this particular topic. Um, so everything that I'll address today dates to about 2017 and forward. Um, there are a number of different topics that this legislation addresses. Identification was mentioned briefly today. Uh, there are a number of states that require voter identification in order to vote in person. And so the issue of tribal IDs has come up in that context. Uh, voter registration is another one and acts of allowing members of tribal nations to access voter registration services. Also polling locations, those are those in-person early voting or election day locations and ballot drop boxes as well. 
Tribal nations are often out west, and there's a large number of Native American voters in sort of the western states. We've seen trends in recent years for a lot of these western states to adopt mostly male ballot elections. I call them mostly male ballot elections in that those states like Nevada typically send mail ballots out, but receive them in a large variety of ways. So they could be received back by mail, or they could also be received back using ballot drop boxes or given to locations that are um, ballot collection locations. There have also been a number of study and advisory committees in states. One of the first steps to look at a particular topic is often to do what your committee is doing and hear, hear testimony and gather information on this topic from a variety of sources. So I'll touch on that as well. Uh, so first to start with identification and registration for voting. Indiana is a state that we at NCSL categorize as a strict photo ID state to vote. What that means is that if you come in in person to vote, you have to show an identification card with a photo on it. And if you're not able to do that, you can vote a provisional ballot. And then there's typically steps after the election that need to take place in order for that provisional ballot to be counted. So typically that's coming back and showing that photo ID then after the fact. Um, so Indi Indiana in 2021 added tribal IDs to the list of acceptable identification to vote in person. Those tribal IDs do have to have a photo. And there are, are a total of 14 states that accept tribal IDs as a form of identification to vote in person. Uh, similarly, Wyoming also allowed tribal IDs to be used for registration to vote. That was in 2020. Uh, and Washington is a state that actually has passed a Native American Voting Rights Act. That was in 2019. So I'll highlight a few provisions of that. But one thing that they passed was a specification that tribal IDs um, do not have to have a residential address or an expiration date to be considered valid for voting. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Washington Native American Voting Rights Act was enacted in 2019 and it did affect uh, the ID requirement, as I mentioned in my previous slide. It also specified that a non-traditional address may be used for voters residing on an Indian reservation or Indian lands, a non-traditional address used for voter registration. So what that is, a traditional address is usually your street address of what we think about of 123 Main Street, for example. Um, a non-traditional address is something that may not have that sort of street identification. So this is common in more rural areas or often on Indian lands where there's just a different way of addressing or in some cases, not much in terms of addressing. Um, so a narrative description is something more to the effect of the house with the green roof that's two miles past the fork of Highway 5 and Highway 9. So that narrative description would be accepted for voter registration now in Washington. Uh, another way to sort of address this issue of voters who may have non-traditional addresses or an address that's kind of um, falls outside the traditional USPS, US Postal Service addressing, is to use tribal government buildings, and that can be designated to serve as a residential or mailing address for mail ballots to be received there. Uh, the other thing that the act did was allow tribal ID cards to be used for online voter registration and also allow tribes to request state facilities to serve as voter registration services. Um, so those could be a variety of existing services already. They're required to provide either voter registration forms or in some way facilitate that voter registration process. Uh, Colorado is another state that has addressed voter registration for members of tribal nations. Um, there was a law in 2019 that was somewhat similar. It addressed this non-traditional addressing issue. So it uh, specified that uh, someone who lives on a reservation who does not have a residential address recognized by USPS can register to vote using the address of the tribal council headquarters. So trying to get at that, that same um, problem. I'll, I'll also mention, particularly because it came up in the last presentation, actually, New Mexico also has something similar, um, trying to deal with non-traditional addresses that uh, an address of the tribal headquarters can be used instead. The other thing that Colorado has done, particularly on voter registration, is that in 2023, it expanded automatic voter registration to include tribal data. So what this means is that the tribe upon approval of the council may provide the Secretary of State's office with basically a registry of tribal members eligible to vote. And that could then be used for automatic voter registration. Uh, another issue is sort of locations of in-person voting. 
which again, we've talked about a lot already today. Um, so a few things that other states have done on this topic. Um, one is Washington requiring at least one ballot drop box location on a reservation um, and also permitting tribes to designate at least one building as a ballot pickup and collection location. And again, that's related to Washington is also mostly mail. And so that opportunity provided to kind of bring ballots, those mail ballots to one location. That's a supervised location by local election officials. They're then able to take those ballots back. Uh, similarly, Colorado passed something in 2019 permitting tribal councils to request voter service and polling centers. Those are their equivalent of sort of early voting and election day voting locations and also ballot drop off locations within the boundaries of the reservation. And then another bill also clarified that tribes can request either two or four days of in person early voting. Um, so that addresses the sort of uh, capacity and availability of early voting in those locations. Uh, and then I highlighted Nevada here. Um, again, you all have done a lot on this topic and we've talked about a few bills already, um, but just to provide some perspective, there are a number of other states that are considering this as well or have done this in the last several years. Uh, New Mexico had mentioned a bit. Um, there was a law in 2021 that required tribal sign off for moving polling locations or modifying hours. Uh, there was actually another bill in 2023 that required closer communication, much like you've done in Nevada with the tribes of where is the polling location that makes the most sense, what are the hours and dates, um, and having that communication about what works best for that tribal location and in-person voting. Uh, Montana, I'll talk about in a minute, actually had a legislative study committee that looked at a variety of different things, but one thing that resulted uh, was a result of that study was the requirement of the governing body of the Indian Reservation to sign off before polling place hours could be shortened. So a number of states have conducted some sort of study um, on this topic. I mentioned Montana. There was a study in 2019 looking at sort of state tri tribal relations and looking at a variety of different issues um, and ways to ease the process for Native American voters. California has a number of different voting accessibility committees to address voting for certain community members. They have another one for voters with disabilities, for example. So in 2020, they specifically created one for Native American voting accessibility to engage that community and see what would be helpful for them to increase voting participation. Uh, starting in 2017, the Secretary of State of New Mexico created a Native American Voting Task Force. Um, and so again, there has been some legislation that was a result of that task force, but there's also just been increased involvement within Native American communities and giving input to the Secretaries of State's office and uh, local clerks about what their communities need in terms of voting locations, voting hours, uh, and support for voting in their communities. And then we also had just a bill introduced just recently within the last couple of weeks in Nebraska. And this one is to require the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs to conduct an ongoing study of Native American voting in the state and things that the legislature or the Secretary of State's office can do to facilitate that. So just a few things that I wanna highlight that are not necessarily legislation related, but what other states are doing. Um, and again, I wanna say Nevada, you, you've done a lot of this already and we've heard a lot today about all the great things you're doing. Um, the extension of the electronic ballot transmission system, the EASE system, which I think we heard a little bit about and we'll hear more about later today. Uh, that is something that's unique thus far in the country. Um, that extension of the service that also serves military and overseas voters and voters with disabilities in some states, extending that to members residing on an Indian reservation. Um, Nevada's a first for that particular extension. Um, there are a few states that are designating entities serving Native communities as voter registration agencies. I think this is also something you've looked at. Um, for example, in Maricopa County, Arizona, there was a, a collaboration between the county clerk's office or the local election official's office and Native Health and because that's a service that serves a lot of those native communities there to be able to provide voter registration services and facilitate that. Uh, another idea that's come up that has not yet been in legislation as far as I've seen, but we have seen come out of some of these study committees. This is again to address that non-traditional addressing issue with voter registration and also receiving mail ballots is to improve geocoding options. 
So Google has something that's called plus codes. So it's essentially a longitude and latitude point on a map. And it's a series of numbers and letters that's unique to a particular residence, for example, so that you can actually pinpoint that residence on a map more specifically than, for instance, that non-traditional description that I described before. And so in Utah, actually, I'm based in Utah. In southern Utah, we have a bit of the Navajo Nation. And there was a movement from a nonprofit organization to create these plus codes and actually put them on residences. So instead of having a street address, which many of them don't, they now have this plus code as a way to identify that address, both for emergency services and then also, of course, for voting registration and receiving your mail ballot. Yeah. Uh, there are also some next generation 911 systems that do something similar. So I, I've heard of a couple of states who are sort of working with their 911 systems as they're upgrading those to provide emergency services to rural areas. They can also have this discussion of can we use those addresses for voter registration. Uh, and of course, I think this is something that you all may have discussed or are doing already, um, but providing election documents, voting materials, educational materials, I voted stickers in native languages can go a long way in sort of encouraging engagement. Um, I want to say, too, this isn't true just for native languages, but also just for any minority language. Um, so we see this a lot in some of the larger cities in the country, Los Angeles, New York, where they have a wide variety of languages used to provide those materials in a variety of different languages as well. Uh, and also ensuring that there are sufficient translation services, recruiting bilingual election officials. We've talked about that already today as well, um, but that's particularly important in native communities where there may be more of a history of sort of oral language or elders may not necessarily read that language, but that's what's spoken. Um, and just that sort of making voters feel at home coming in and having representatives from their tribe or their community be the election workers um, is something that states have been considering as well. Um, so that is the end of my presentation, um, but want to reiterate again, if you have any questions, there's anything you want me to follow up on uh, that I can go back and research for you, I'm more than happy to do that. And of course, Mr. Chair, take any questions that you might have right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Owens Hubler, for the presentation. We appreciate all the support the National Conference of State Legislatures provides to us as legislators, to our Legislative Council Bureau, and helping us, uh, you know, with uh, these little laboratories of democracy. Every state legislature is, and trying to make sure we we work on good policy for our constituents. Members, any questions for Ms. Owens Hubler, Vice Chair Mosca? Thank you, Chair, and thank you so much for being here today. And if, if you don't have this answer, I'd just love to get a follow-up. But when we were talking about the voting locations and the ballot drop boxes, especially in Washington and Colorado, do you know if they fund that through their counties? Is it state funding or, or how they pay for that? Uh, thank you. Yes, that's an, an interesting question. Funding, as you may know, of elections is a complicated issue. Um, I would say in most cases, it is likely found funded by the counties themselves. Um, but that is something I can look at and get back to you on that answer specifically for those states. Thank you very much, Ms. Owens Hubler. Members, any additional questions here at the Sawyer Building up in Carson City or on Zoom? Any questions for Ms. Owens Hubler? Then uh, Senator Daly. No, no questions. No questions. Well, I have just a couple, so I appreciate the committee's indulgence. Um, and if again, if you don't have the answer, maybe that's something, if, if you can find it later, provide us, that would be great if you have time. Um, the remoteness of some tribal locations. We heard testimony earlier about how some of our tribal lands here in Nevada are so remote from uh, the county seat that that creates a challenge. And I wonder if any other states, if they've come up with any ways to address uh, transportation of the voting, the, the, the voting memory drive to make sure that it's safely transported, getting adequate member, uh, poll workers to be able to, to staff those poll, polling locations. That's one question I have. And then I had another question. We heard testimony from Ms. Martinez from the Walker River Paiute tribe about how her tribal members felt more comfortable when the poll workers were fellow tribal members as opposed to someone uh, not not a member of the community from that tribe being sent out. And I wondered if other states have made any efforts to try to 
make sure that when there are polling locations on tribal lands that they try to find tribal members to be the poll workers. And if you don't have the answer now, maybe that's something, if, if there is an answer, you could provide us later, but just wonder if any states have tried to address those issues. Yeah, from the perspective of legislation, I have not seen legislation specifically requiring poll, uh, poll workers to be members of the tribe for those locations, for example. Um, I, I am interested, actually. I, I will go back and, and research that a little bit further to make sure that I'm, I'm confident in saying that. Anecdotally, from states that do have reservations, I have heard that they do try to recruit from those communities, both because of transportation issues. Um, as you mentioned, there are quite a few, there are polling locations that are pretty far away from a lot of other locations. Um, we have one here in Utah where the county seat is about a five hour drive from one of the farthest locations, which is on the Navajo Nation. In order to get there, there's a couple of canyons in the way and a, a lake in one case. Um, so you actually have to go down into Arizona and come back up to get there. Um, so that location is, I think, staffed by local members of the tribe in some cases, but there are also members from the clerk's office who come and staff that location as well. Um, and that issue of sort of paying for accommodations, uh, that was interesting and not something I'd necessarily heard before, but could see that be an issue for some of these far from locations. Um, so what I can say is that's not something I've necessarily seen legislated, um, but in practice, that is something that other states are grappling with and addressing um, and, and trying to find, as you may know, poll workers and, and keeping poll workers and keeping election officials is, is an issue right now nationwide and something that every state is grappling with. Thank you very much. Appreciate your presentation today, Ms. Owens Hubler, and all the support that the National Conference of State Legislatures provides to us. Uh, thank you. Uh, not seeing any additional questions, members, I would like to now uh, pass the gavel to Vice Chair Mosca, who is going to be conducting the hearing on agenda items five and six. Vice Chair Mosca. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And with that, we will move on to agenda item five, which is the overview of the effective absentee system for elections for uniformed military voters, overseas citizens, voters with disabilities, and tribal voter living on Indian colonies and reservations. We have uh, Mr. Gabe DeCara, the Chief Deputy Secretary of State um, in Carson City, and Mr. Mark Velashin, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections uh, here in Las Vegas. You may start. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair. Uh, Mark Velashin, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the Record. Uh, thank you for having us here today uh, to talk about the effective absentee system for elections. <clears throat> Starting with the, uh, a quick overview of the statutory authorities to make sure we're all on the same page in regards to the system, where it came from, and a little bit about the history, and then we'll move into some specifics relating to the presidential preference primary uh, and the use of ease uh, during this ongoing election cycle. Uh, so first, to start with, uh, NRS 293D.200 uh, talks about the system of approved electronic transmission. That statute was put in place in 2011. Uh, this, this statute uh, and the ease system that came from it um, were also a part, um, partly related to the federal act, the Uniform and Overseas Citizen Absentee Voting Act of 1986, and the Military and Overseas Voting Empowerment Act of 2008. Those federal acts, I mention them because they're extremely important in understanding that the federal government back in 86 and again in 08 identified opportunities for military and overseas citizens to vote in, in their state elections and in federal elections specifically where they had a federal candidate on their ballot. And this ease system that was developed uh, and that has been in place ultimately since 2014 uh, is a major part of its expansion. Uh, so in other words, again, federal law is, is uh, it provided some provisions, uh, but our state laws have continued to expand those opportunities for our voters uh, across the country and indeed across the world. Uh, in the last handful of uh, uh, legislative sessions, too, in 21 and in 23, the universe of covered voters, as we refer to it, uh, of individuals who are authorized to use the effective absentee system for election has expanded as well. Uh, and just to paint a little bit better of a picture as to what that looks like, uh, we've done some estimates. Uh, there's approximately 13,000 at any given moment uh, Nevadans that are on the active duty roles of our armed forces. Uh, you might think it's easier to get that number, but given the Title 10 responsibilities of each branch to man, train, and equip their staff and the, the, their services, uh, they all actually act independently. Uh, we do work closely with the Federal Voter Assistance Program. The, uh, it's called FVAP, uh, a, a subcomponent of the Department of Defense. Uh, 
uh, for outreach, uh, but again, about 13,000 individuals were initially covered by the EASE system. Since then, in 2021, uh, with the expansion uh, identified in Assembly Bill 121, uh, that expanded the use of EASE to uh, what I was told is as many as one in six Nevadan voters uh, may qualify to use the EASE system. Again, we're, we're speaking specifically to those identified uh, as having a disability, uh, along with, and that's the, the ADA compliant uh, definition that is uh, also in regulation now. Uh, this last legislative session, as we mentioned in a previous presentation today, expanding it to tribal members who reside on a, a reservation or a colony. Uh, again, uh, won't speak for each of the 28 tribal nations at all, uh, but the rough estimate that I found was approximately 30,000 tribal members too across our state uh, are now eligible to, be, to, to use the EASE system. So again, kind of a, a big picture overview. Uh, the, the system itself uh, is accessible at nvees.gov. Uh, it's a, the, the website portal to get you to the, uh, the starting screen. Um, it allows a covered voter, again, one of those groups, uh, an individual in the group on the previous slide, uh, to both register and apply and cast their ballot up to the close of polls. And, and that's an important part too. I think I wanna quickly identify that the, the federal UACAVA, the Uniform and Overseas Citizen Absentee Voting Act, um, established a process where there's a federal postcard application. Military service member, for example, can Google the form, find it, fill it out, mail it in from the, the embassy that they're at or, or duty station across the, the planet. Uh, that, that letter gets to their county clerk or registrar that then begins a dialogue back and forth with those service members. Uh, at times it can be challenging uh, if you're in parts of the, the, uh, the planet or on the, around the world rather that uh, it, mail is remote. Uh, that can take weeks. Uh, indeed, uh, during the four years I lived in Japan, it was about a three month process, they said, to get Christmas presents back to family members in the state. So a lot of forethought required uh, to, to be involved with, with family. And it would be no different with the voting process. With the ease system though, a service member on election day that morning can wake up and realize it's election day. Uh, and then without even having registered, if they, if they have a residence, if they're qualified, if they're uh, able to get to access to a, a computer or even on their phones, go to nves.gov. Uh, they can fill out the information, provide the home of residence uh, somewhere in the state. And, and as long as they submit it before 7 p.m. and close the polls, uh, they will have registered to vote and cast their ballot, again, regardless of the location that they're at uh, around the world. Uh, greatly enhancing their ability and access uh, compared to the, the previously uh, identified federal system. Uh, in addition, uh, again, the system itself uh, provides all the other sort of opportunities that a voter would have uh, if they were voting on the polls or, or by mail ballot, frankly. Uh, our mail ballot envelopes uh, by statute identify who assists the voter. If they are assisted, the E system does the same. Uh, our, our voting machines in person are required to be able to identify an undervote. Uh, if you says pick two or pick three for a, a small, you know, or a, a county or township office. Uh, if you only pick one, our systems will say, hey, you only picked one. Are you, are you sure you don't want to pick the other two to confirm? Uh, the ease system does as well. Those same systems also prevent overvotes, uh, as does the ease system. So if it is a pick one, it does not allow you to inadvertently click or select a number of different uh, candidates as part of that selection process. Um, it allows, of course, the a review of choices. It's not uh, an autonomous process uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And then it does also solicit feedback. And, and I've got some examples that I'll show you today as well, uh, and with more available if, if the committee would like to see it. Uh, at the end of the process, the voter does get to pick how they want to return their ballot. Uh, again, this, and I think that really also gives me an opportunity to speak to the, the ease system is but one of a number of ways uh, that under federal and state law, voters are able to vote. And, and I think that's truly, well, uh, you know, many of us in the elections division and really across the state um, are, are pretty passionate about sharing the word about ease and, and making sure that we conduct a lot of outreach. At the end of the day, the, the goal is to enable voters to vote in the manner of their choosing, period. Two weeks of early voting for our primary or general election coming up. Uh, 12 hours by law uh, on election day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., a mail ballot being sent to every active registered voter that they can either mail back or hand deliver to their county election official uh, or the ease system. Uh, again, the, the goal is options uh, as provided by law so that those voters can vote and, and have their voices heard in the manner of their choosing. Uh, and the return method for ease, uh, again, speaks to that. 
there's an, an opportunity for them to print, mail, or fax uh, their uh, ballot selections back. Uh, there's also an opportunity for them to save it, uh, scan it, and email it to their county election officials. Uh, but our, our preferred and recommended method uh, is a secure transmittal. Uh, by not involving email in the process, we encourage folks to, to use that secure transmittal that essentially takes the information and puts it directly onto the, the Secretary of State's secure server. Uh, for transmission directly to their county election officials, eliminating or rather more greatly reducing the risk of any cyber threat. Uh, I do want to highlight also that EASE is now used for all of Nevada's elections. Uh, prior to the passage of Assembly Bill 121, uh, it was intended as a, a tool to support voting in an election with a federal candidate on the ballot. Uh, but after the passage of Assembly Bill 121, EASE became an ADA tool. Uh, and therefore, uh, regardless of the size or scope of the election across our state, uh, if there is an election uh, that is governed by Title 24, uh, the nine chapters of our statutes, then ease will be used for it. And that's as small as a, a single jurisdiction uh, having a, a special election or a recall election, uh, the ease system will be turned on and, and employed uh, to support voter opportunities and, and uh, as an option. Uh, the timeline for use. By federal law, uh, those mail ballots that are required to be sent out uh, to military and overseas voters must go out uh, not less than 45 days prior to an election with federal candidates. Um, seeing as how our counties uh, make a point to do so and, and comply, of course, with that law during the week leading up to that day, so in, in, in most cases it's not on the, the night of the 44th day that those ballots are being sent out, it's the week prior, the, the 45th day, interestingly enough, when you look at it from a Tuesday is typically a Saturday. Uh, so the Monday to Friday before that, that deadline is when the mail ballots go out. Uh, and to keep in the spirit of that federal requirement, uh, we also turn on and you activate the ease system uh, during that week prior to the, the deadline uh, for any, uh, again, election that has a federal candidate on it. Uh, for special elections, again, some of these have a, a very tight timeline. Uh, per the, the state constitution, for example, it's a, it's a very quick timeline, timeline for a recall election um, that may not allow for 45 days. Uh, our standard is a minimum of two weeks before election day, again, to facilitate uh, uh, voter participation. And again, in many of those special elections that I'm referring to, uh, it's, it's an election day with, with perhaps one or two days of early voting only. Uh, but the goal is, again, to, to increase access as much as possible um, so it's it's at least two weeks beforehand. Uh, two dates that I do want to highlight, uh, again, just for your awareness, uh, specific to this year and this election cycle, uh, the 45th day prior to the primary election on June 11th is uh, April 27th. Um, the ease system will be on, turned on that week prior to. Uh, and then for the general election, again, not later than September 21st. Uh, again, very critical deadlines that we take very seriously to support and ensure uh, that voters have access and again, are, are able to get ballots and, or to vote and make their voices heard in the manner of their choosing. Some specific uh, statistics relating to our most recent uh, election, the presidential preference primary. Uh, so you can see that the, the system, uh, we test it. There is a decent amount of work, the county and state, that goes into getting it ready to go. Uh, and, and I'll speak to some of the, the security measures here in a moment as well. But just from a, a pure operational standpoint, uh, we had the system, we turned it on the morning of December 20th. Uh, and within about an hour, uh, we noticed that somebody had already used it to vote. <laughs> so it's, it's a, a system that, that voters are aware of. Uh, they, they pay attention to and they ask when it's going to be on and then they take advantage and use that. Um, so again, considering the election was February 6th and the, the first vote was cast in, in our election cycle in 24 and on December 20th by 10.23 a.m. Uh, in the last submission, as I mentioned, that it, it's designed and set up to automatically shut off after the close of polls uh, at 7 p.m. typically on election day. Um, you can see that we've had submissions here on, for the, the president's preference primary. The last one was at, at 5.47 p.m. Uh, I will tell you we've had submissions previously at 6.50 and 6.55 as voters, again, registered and, and submit their ballot. I, I do want to clarify also, and it's probably the right time to do it, uh, the way the system is set up, uh, it, it does not have a, a voter use the system, and then when they hit submit, that it goes right to the, the tabulation without anything, there's no review, that is not the case. 
Um, when I say that, that the last submission was at 547, the voter hit submit at 547, and that sent a packet through the secure transmittal process directly to that county election official. And the packet of information includes a voter registration form or a federal postcard application as applicable uh, so that the county election official uh, in accordance with the other statutes that govern how we tabulate ballots, not later than the seventh day, uh, for example, uh, they're able to review and make sure that the voter is eligible, uh, hasn't voted otherwise, too. That, that's an important part, so that if somebody submits a mail ballot, gets nervous that it hasn't arrived yet, and goes on to ease again to make sure that only one ballot is counted, uh, that there's no question about the integrity of the electoral process, even through this system. Um, so while, well, again, it's close to the close of polls, I don't want anyone to think that we rush any point uh, at any point or any element or step of this process. Um, of our 17 counties, again, uh, highlighting the, the increased number that were used, uh, 10 counties out of our 17 had eased ballots submitted. Um, again, when you, when you think about the overall voter turnout of the presidential preference primary compared to, say, uh, the general election this November, uh, it was significantly lower than we'll see both in June and November. Uh, but still, uh, again, I think the, the total, the, the highest number of ease ballots ever submitted, at least that I can recall, was about 1,279 uh, during the 2020 uh, presidential election or 2022 presidential election, excuse, or 2020 presidential, excuse me. Uh, it was a little bit less than that in 22's general. Uh, but the fact that we had you know, almost 480 uh, use it already for the presidential preference primary um, it, it speaks to the outreach efforts uh, of the state and county election officials, the awareness, uh, and again, the, the opportunities for voters. Uh, again, not better or worse, uh, simply another opportunity for voters to vote uh, in the manner of their choosing. Uh, I provided a breakdown of who submitted those ballots. Again, active duty service members. I do want to clarify that if we have uh, you know, members of the National Guard, if they're on active duty orders, they are able to use it. Uh, and again, it does not require they be deployed. Uh, the federal law spoke to only if you were away on election day. Uh, the way our statutes read is that an active duty service member, again, regardless of, of whether they're in or out of the state, is able to use the system, which is important too, given how many times, uh, again, service members are sent to training locations in, in other states across the, the union um, without necessarily deploying uh, outside of the contiguous United States. Uh, military spouses uh, as well. Uh, again, I wanted to highlight that too. It's not just the service members, but those family members who are, are uh, voting age. Uh, spouses and children uh, referred to as dependents by the military that are voting age are also eligible to use the system. Um, uh, again, for active duty service members, uh, and then overseas citizens. Uh, you know, there there's some that I have seen that that you know tried to explain where their address was in extremely remote parts of different countries. Um, but through the system, the way it's set up, uh, we're able to track on a daily basis, uh, in, in fact, in real time, so that if a voter uh, uses the e-system, says and expresses in the comments, hey, I'm not sure if this worked. Uh, I haven't had power for a couple days. I got it for a few minutes. I wanted to make sure I voted. Uh, you know, and then and typically some sort of comment about how they're you know, from Henderson or somewhere around here in the state. Uh, just checking in. Um, we were able to respond to that uh, almost in real time to let them know, yes, we got it. Or if there was a question or concern, we can we can respond to and support that voters uh, concerns as well. Uh, and then an increased num number of, of voters with a disability. Uh, again, uh, as we of course, every in-person polling location is ADA compliant uh, by both federal and state law, uh, but also, again, we, and we're also now providing mail ballots to every active registered voter. Uh, but lastly, again, ease is, is an opportunity for, for voters to, again, cast ballots in the manner of their choosing. I, I put, and I wanted to highlight this, the tribal voters, uh, it was zero uh, this time. Again, as, as Chief Takara had mentioned previously, uh, we are continuing to work on our outreach uh, to make sure that, that voters are aware of that. Um, I don't believe that it speaks to the system uh, itself, uh, but again, recognizing that there are other in-person opportunities on tribal uh, uh, lands across the state, um, that, that zero is something that I'm, I'm eagerly hoping to get to be above zero. Uh, but again, ultimately, if it depends on the tribal voters and how they choose to vote. Uh, so if it ends up staying at zero, but there's uh, increased tribal turnout uh, through other means, uh, then, then again, ultimately, uh, that, that's the goal of, of uh, the overall process in the statutes. Uh, three examples of feedback. 
Uh, there were, I will say, while well, these are positive ones, uh, and I don't want you to think that I'm simply cherry picking the good ones and then hiding the rest. Uh, again, I do have all of those available. Uh, there were questions, and, and frankly, a lot of the comments that we receive uh, mirror the, the uh, questions that we get from voters otherwise through email and phone calls, questions about uh, is there not a write-in process? Folks not realizing that in statutes here in Nevada, we don't allow for write-in candidates, those sorts of things. Um, and, and again, we view those all as opportunities for education. Uh, and I, I, in fact, personally reached out to a number of individuals who, who asked about different statutes and provisions. Uh, you know, I, I thought we could do this or that uh, to, to clarify. Uh, again, uh, a great thing about our state is that we are small enough so we can have that personal level of interaction with voters uh, to understand their, their concerns, their location, their needs, uh, and then to reassure them about the security of the overall process. Outreach efforts. Uh, this absolutely is going to be con a continued focus, um, not just now, but looking to the future, especially now that this is an ADA tool. Uh, we want to make sure, I mean, if, if by itself is a, a great tool, but again, if nobody knows about it, then it's uh, not nearly as effective as it could be. Um, so we are continuing uh, and focusing on outreach to make sure that voters across the state understand how it works, why it works, and the security measures. Uh, we have an ability to uh, provide demonstrations, and I do want to stress everyone across the board, even if you're not a covered voter, uh, you are able to request a, a demo by reaching out to nvelect at sos.nv.gov. Uh, what that looks like is we would share our screen via a Teams call. Uh, and we have a, essentially a test version of the, the program that we use for development uh, that we could share the screen, walk individuals through the process. Um, we, we found that that actually works surprisingly well uh, with a lot of family members um, of active duty service members. And I, I've done that process personally with a number of them. Uh, the idea being that they're like, well, I don't want to recommend it to my, my son or daughter who's in the military until I kind of see what, what it is in the first place. Um, and so those sorts of demonstrations, I think, also contribute to the, the overall increase. Um, because it is, by the way, and this is something I want to highlight, uh, an interesting Venn diagram. When you look at individuals who are active duty military, their families and overseas citizens, when you compare that population to tribal voters who live on a colony or reservation, tribal voters, uh, you may not realize, but uh, tribal nations across our country by uh, per capita uh, have more individuals join the military than any other group uh, or population across the, the country. Um, so there's the active duty military, and, and oftentimes when you talk to an active duty mil military uh, service member or their family, you may also be talking to a tribal member. Uh, and then there's also uh, an overlap uh, with um, in some cases, veterans that have disabilities or otherwise, or just individuals in general. Uh, there was a number of, of my own uh, Marines and sailors that I worked with over the years that would send money back home to support their parents who were disabled, by, and they did that by joining the active duty forces. Um, so we, we found that when we time our out outreach and when we, we make sure that we don't just say, well, hey, here's how it works for active duty military, but really open up the entire universe during those demonstrations, uh, more than one individual usually will say, hey, wait a minute, that actually can I, so I can tell my parents about this or uh, the, the family back on the, the tribal nation or on the reservation rather, uh, and we encourage that. So again, that we're, we're cognizant of that and, and certainly encourage that as part of our outreach efforts to make sure that, again, individuals who are eligible to use it are aware of it. Uh, and then modifications, uh, pleased but not satisfied uh, across the board. Uh, the ease system, the program is, is incredible, I think. Uh, I've seen it grow and develop even in the few years that I've been here at the Office of Secretary of State. Um, we, we've continued to enhance it based on user feedback from voters across the country. Uh, as folks say, you know, questions about uh, can I use it on my phone and, and assisting us by providing feedback and testing essentially uh, about that user experience to make sure that, that while staying within the boundaries, of course, uh, of statutory and federal requirements, uh, that we are continuing to enhance it as we look to the future. Uh, we, we also recently set it up, again, now that it's an, uh, an ADA tool, we wanted to make sure that it could support concurrent elections. The idea being that, uh, in fact, we may soon have a recall election that overlaps with another election, with the time periods and the use, especially when you think about 45 days of having the system on. Um, so we recently have, have supported and made a, a secure process by which we can now conduct concurrent elections. Uh, so that, again, no excuse for us to uh, to not have that available. Again, as it's an ADA tool, and we want to make sure voters have access to it. And then lastly, uh, ongoing security checks and maintenance. Uh, the cyber threat isn't getting smaller. It only continues to grow. Foreign and domestic actors are getting increasingly creative on how they're trying to attack, harass, and otherwise disrupt uh, 
any sort of uh, electronic system, uh, not the least of which is elections. Uh, so we continue to uh, do ongoing checks, maintenance. Uh, there's a number of federal and state partners that we're working with to continue to not just assume that it's secure, but to make sure that we are looking at every possible cutting edge opportunity for improvement and enhancing the security of the program that we can, uh, and then absolutely uh, and aggressively pursuing that uh, for the security of the process as well. That being said, are there any questions? Uh, Thank you so much for okay. that important uh, presentation. We'll go to you. Um, Mr. Takira. Uh, apologies. Uh, uh, thank you, Vice Chair. I just wanted to add on, as, as this was an item that came up in the uh, previous NCSL presentation, and it's something that uh, our team worked hard on and should be proud of. Gabriel Takira, for the record, I apologize. Um, uh, when uh, the, the bills were passed to uh, uh, expand ease to uh, members of uh, Nevada tribes living on reservations or colonies. Um, that didn't just include voting, that also included registration. And our uh, elections division uh, worked very closely with our IT team um, to come up with uh, a new uh, pathway for uh, tribal members to register to vote online using ease with their tribal ID as opposed to with uh, uh, their state driver's license, for example, as there are members of tribes who may have that tribal ID as their primary form of identification. Um, so that's something that we are uh, uh, proud of, of putting together and are, uh, as Deputy Velashin said, excited to uh, educate voters on and, and expand further. Thank you. Thank you, and we can stay up there in Carson City for questions. Members, any questions in Carson City? No, thank you. Seeing none, we can move. Thank you. Uh, we can now move to the Zoom. Any questions on Zoom? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now we will move to here at in Las Vegas. Chair. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, first of all, I just want to make a, a comment. I, these changes, I think Assembly Bill 121, I was so proud of the work the Secretary of State did working with Assemblywoman Cohen on that bill to extend the ease system to disabled voters. Uh, and it's just tremendous looking at that, the statistics there about how uh, many disabled voters took advantage of the system. So I want to thank the Secretary's Office, Deputy Walshin, Chief Deputy DeGuerra, Secretary Aguilar for working with Assemblywoman Cohen on that bill. And it was really exciting on the NCSL presentation, seeing how other states are looking at what uh, Nevada did in Senate Bill 216 to expand ease to tribal members as a model. So that's just tremendous. And I'm so uh, thankful that the Secretary's Office, Deputy Walshin, Chief Deputy DeGuerra, Secretary came came up with that idea and, and sought that amendment. I guess one question I have, and again, this might be something that maybe, I don't know if you have the information now. If not, you could send it to us. On the, I'm looking at, I guess it's slide six, at the 479 total ease users. Do you have a breakdown as to how many of those users use the secure server to cast their ballot as opposed to uh, printing it out, scanning it, mailing at the other options that ease voters have. If you don't have that now, maybe you could send it to us later. Uh, thank you for the question, Chair. Mark Velasco, for the record. Uh, I'll get that breakdown. We do have it, though. Uh, the vast preponderance were uh, through the secure method. Um, some did print it out and mail it in, though, but I'll get you these specific numbers. Thank you. And Vice Chair, may I have one follow-up? Yes, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, the, on, again, on slide six, those overseas citizens who participate in ease I, I just can't remember, is that a, a change that happened with uh, Assemblyman Cohen's bill, or was that always part of the ease system where overseas voters who are not members of the active duty military or their spouses can participate? Thank you for the question, Chair Mark Velas, for the record. Uh, the overseas citizens were originally covered by the Uniform and Overseas Citizens Absentee Voting Act, so that was part of the process before. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions in Las Vegas? 
And I had uh, two questions for you. Can you share about how this works through your office? Is there one person in particular in charge of it or and those operations? And then is it like something where I would go on and I would sign up and I would say, I would like to use this. Please send me a reminder closer to the date. Um, or is it just people know that they need to go on and do it during the time period? Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair, for the questions. Mark Velocity, for the record. Uh, so the the... The program itself is, uh, is is truly a team effort uh, in the Office of the Secretary of State and really at the counties as well. Uh, the county election officials have to provide the data about the precinct breakdown uh, to the elections division. We have staff members that take that technical data uh, because each ballot, even on ease, is precinct specific. Um, that technical data has to be combined with, uh, again, members of our IT staff and members from the Elections Division reviewed for accuracy. Uh, and, and then a number of us work together to make sure that the system is prepared, ready to go, and tested uh, up and down uh, to make sure that it functions as appropriate. Uh, so it is not one individual. It's essentially a, a partial collateral duty for, uh, I would say, easily about six or seven of the 18 members of the Elections Division. Um, in regards to, to how to sign up for it, uh, again, no sign up required at all, in fact. Uh, NVEs.gov, uh, any covered voter can go there or even someone that's just curious about the process to see what it says. Uh, but if you go to NVEs.gov today, for example, uh, it will say this is where you go when it's on, but it's not on today because we're not within 45 days of, of the federal election. Um, or for that matter, is there a special election going on? There's not one right now either. Um, so there's, there's no sign-up requirement. The sign-up, in essence, then, becomes a voter who wants to use the system, goes in, and it fills out the, uh, the web form that asks for their data, their name, birth date, and a number of other things. Um, it, it does sync so that if you are already registered to vote, uh, it will pull your signature, the latest on file, from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Uh, so that way you, they can, you can either confirm that that's you, or if you want to change it or update it, you're able to do that as well. Uh, through a number of different ways, um, but all of that information that it asks you becomes part of that initial application that gets submitted to the county election officials um, so that they have that information to review. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions, I just want to thank you all for what you're doing to make sure we have options for voters here in Nevada. And with that, we'll move on to agenda item six, presentations on outreach efforts and language access for elections. We again have um, Gabriel DeCara, Chief Deputy Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Mark Velashin, Deputy, Sec Deputy Secretary of State for Elections, and Sabrina Hagen Finks, Language Access Liaison. When you're ready, you may begin. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair and Mark Velashin, Deputy Secretary of State for Elections for the Record. Um, before I turn uh, the presentation over to my colleague, I do want to provide a little bit of a background about the Language Access Program. Um, this was something that we identified uh, in the Elections Division and, and the Secretary of State that we've had extensive discussions about over the last few years. Uh, it speaks to not just the need for individuals who maybe uh, are more comfortable in a foreign language or a different language than English, uh, but really are, it ties into our overall outreach and voter education plan. Uh, American citizens need and deserve and want, they're hungry to understand how our electoral processes work. Uh, as part of that discussion on how we can best inform and educate voters, uh, we have realized, and this was in part, as you'll see, informed by the 2020 census, uh, that with Nevada being the third most diverse state in the union, uh, there is an increased need uh, for us to provide not just voter information, but voter information in a, in a means, in a medium uh, that is accessible to, to voters uh, and to meet them where they're at. Uh, to that end, uh, the legislature approved uh, two positions in the Elections Division during this last legislative session. Um, and my colleague, um, Sabrina Hagen Finks, uh, to my left, uh, is the program officer overseeing that. Um, I will tell you that this is maybe a week after uh, her third month in the Elections Division. So while she is relatively new to elections, she is, I want to stress, not new to supporting the needs of Nevadans. Uh, her experience and background and her along with uh, Ms. Karina Karen uh, have done an incredible job in just the 90 days to, to build this program and, and it's on a great trajectory that I'm excited to have her present about. Uh, that being said, I'll turn it over to Sabrina. Okay. 
I apologize, I have to learn this microphone system, but I'll get it together. Um, good morning, thank you for having me. My name is Sabrina Hagen Finks. I am the language access liaison here at the Secretary of State in specific to the Elections Department. As um, Mr. Velashen said, I'm a part of a two-person team located down here in Las Vegas, um, but we have the capability and the accessibility and the desire to meet more of the state um, and make sure that parity is um, granted throughout um, the state. We work in tandem um, with the entire elections division, but um, probably most closely with the public information officer to ensure that information gets out to the public um, with clarity. Um, as you may know, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, this is me. I apologize, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, trying to start the presentation, I appear to have locked the computer. Do you have a? Thank you. Uh, and for the record, it's not Windows L. <laughs> Control L. Thank you very much. I apologize. Oh, this. As you may be aware, the Secretary of State is responsible for the execution and enforcement of state laws, state and federal laws governing Nevada's elections. Um, we are specific to Section 203 um, of, the, of the Voting Rights Act, which requires the, um, by federal law that certain information... Sorry to interrupt, Ms. Higginfix. Do you mind um, speaking closer to the mic? Oh, thank I'm you. sorry. Better? Better? Okay, um, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act the Voting Rights Act requires that information on elections is granted in specific languages other than English. In Nevada, two counties are specific to um, this allocation, and it's Clark County, which has the mandate for Spanish and Filipino or Tagalog, and in Nye County for the Shoshone language. Um, for the native and the tribal voters. Additionally, um, we are regulated by the Americans with Disabilities Act to make sure that information accessible um, is available to those who are visually impaired as well as hearing impaired. At the 82nd session, I believe, of the legislature, SB 484 was approved um, for voter education materials and outreach. Um, with this, in that allocation, there was um, some validation for tra traditional elections materials, which were um, ballot materials, mailed content, stickers, and the things that we all traditionally see at the voting locations. However, there was additional allocation for mandated languages, which encompassed um, translation of documentation, as well as interpretive services for those with limited English proficiencies. Limited English proficiency was defined um, through Section 03 as those whose native or first learning language is not English, thus contemplation and understanding are more familiar in a non-English pre presentation. So as we move forward, not only did the uh, secretary and deputy and chief um, make sure that we knew coming into this project that we had the mandate to spouse Spanish and Filipino, but also rendered um, very strong um, presentation that had been geared up and focused from the community partners that they had worked with and voices of the community, representation of the community, to make sure that we have materials translated in Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Thai as well. This has not been an easy feat. Um, I think oftentimes we think of translation as send the document out, get it back, put it out there. And that is true to some extent, but we also have to look at the information that has been traditionally written and presented to the public on elections has been prepared at mastered and sometimes PhD, by mastered and PhD leveled um, individuals and the conversation or the presentation is typically informational, sorry, and not necessarily educational. So as we created and we tried to foster um, what the community really could serve 
from top to bottom of the state or how we could best serve, we wanted to look at making sure that the literacy and the presentation was at levels of all of the constituents, so that we could read and we could be, the information could be conveyed not only in writing, but also in other mediums. We looked at, um, we have taken um, some significant time looking at other states' models and seeing what they're doing, also activating um, access through conferences, um, some televised conferences, to identify where we could best serve. And not only is it those people who are traditionally voting, but we really want to also look at those people who are not traditionally voting and finding out what are the barriers that are keeping them from taking part, not only in the voting, but registering or taking part in the entire electoral process. We did identify some classifications, and I use that term lightly, but we wanted to look at the non-voter and the why of the non-voter. We wanted to look at the skeptic. Was the skeptic not participating because of what they've heard or not participating because they don't have access to factual information from a singular or a limited source? Um, we also looked at the intermittent voter. Um, are, those, are there those people who only feel that the general election is where their voice should be heard or could not be heard? We wanted to look at the intermittent voter to see why they were not participating in the primary election. Did they even know what the primary election was about? And also how to find out what is on that primary election and how it feeds down to the general election. We also looked at what were the things or the functions that either inhibited the process of taking part in the system, the priority of taking part in the system, or the perception, perhaps there would be special circumstances. As you heard today in some of the other presentations, um, lack of understanding, lack of access to information. We found um, in our engagement with um, some tribal, some native um, representatives that use of the tribal ID had been a concern, um, which has been addressed, but it still was a concern that was, that was communicated to us. We also heard that um, um, for the military participants, that there was some confusion about, I've been to this state and I have a driver's license from this state and I have a driver's license from this state and I have a driver's license from this state, where am I to vote? That was also a confusion. We also had some um, perception issues with those coming out of um, state incarceration and I never could vote. I was taking off of the voter rolls, I was never allowed to vote, but yet and still, Many people are not aware that the Nevada law states that once you have served your term in the state's incarceration system, you can be restored. You're actually automatically restored. So it's those types of things and perceptions. Also, let me throw out another one. Um, the 17-year-olds, that they have the ability to pre-register to vote. And that is not something that we commonly hear. Um, maybe we hear it in our election circles. But the question has come up out of the general population, who knows these things? And so it's important for us to investigate as we create not only the language access piece, but the voter education piece. And that is, if we don't understand in English as native English speakers, and we create language or we create barriers in English, translation is going to be even more complicated. So we're looking at both the language piece and the voter education piece, and trying to break down those barriers to access. Um, on this slide, we talked about the objectives, and I will note that typically we see the objectives, the SMART objectives. I purposely and intently left out timelines just for accountability purposes, but I did want to really highlight some of these without going over them, you know, word for word. The first one really was important to create a language access space. Um, the Nevada Secretary of State has a website that's very busy in nature. It's very it has a single color. It's not what we've traditionally seen in, um, 
in most of the modern, and that is being worked on. But for now, we couldn't necessarily say that that was an excuse for not getting information out. So we wanted to create a specific space, a specific language access space to at least begin gathering information and posting information. I will say that one of the mandates in the very beginning was to have several, it's about eight or nine pages that were traditional to traditionally presented in English in the process of voter registration, mail ballot, very informational nature. We wanted to get those things translated and put on the website. However, those translations had to be, um, in all fairness, they had to be very literal because, uh, let me back up. I speak English. I know a little Spanish. I am a little, 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 little sign language. So when we approach this, we're approaching this almost as um, we don't speak those languages. And so we have the same barrier that many of the other people have. So our goal was to, well, not our goal, how we used this translation services is we contracted through the state's purchasing um, portals and, and uh, streamline processes to secure um, existing translation service providers um, that could take our information, translate it as literal as possible, and just review for culturization to make sure that the language is not offensive, but not necessarily change the content or the context. Just wanted to kind of, you know, make sure that we didn't throw anybody off. The second piece of this phased implement, well, the first piece of the phased implementation was the verbatim translation, as I said. And what you would see if you went, looked at the website right now is those nine or 10 pages that we actually translated verbatim. Um, we, it's in a PDF download, it's available if people want to look at it, but it doesn't have a lot of encouraging engagement. The second phase of our um, implementation was to really create content, actually much of what is already on there, but to parse it out into bite-sized pieces that are more palatable and also to um, create some visualization. Um, as you'll note in just about everything on our site, it's very text heavy and it's not extraordinarily engaging if you're not a text heavy reader. So our goal was to create some fast facts and some pages that look like the people that were asking to read our literature. So we're looking for, um, we've contracted to find some photos and some imagery to incur, to include on our literature and make it more news, I don't even want to say newsletter-ish, more magazine newsletter-ish so that it's more presentable, it's more invitable, it's more palatable and maybe somebody will look and say, hey, you know, they look like me. Um, the third piece, which I kind of alluded to in the second piece, is to really create bite-sized content um, so that people can actually look at a building block or look through building blocks to actually see what the election system is because it's so much more than just going to the polls. It's about registering. It's about understanding your candidates and the candidate offices and the roles and the responsibilities. It's about understanding how to access. It's about understanding where to ask questions and where to find valid, reliable information. So in those three phase, it's not something we can do in three months. It's not something we could do even just in four months, but we ask for your patience as we go to develop. In objective two, we talked about um, creating a cadre of resources, and that's really going through those different phases of how we can do this. Um, we're looking at different messaging mechanisms. We're looking at um, making sure that any presentation we have, whether it's in person, whether it is um, via telephone, whether it is a print medium, it's nonpartisan in nature, and it's non-candidate pushing in nature, which is kind of challenging at times, but that's what the people deserve. They deserve us to give them factual information that they can engage in. It's also important that we, um, that we have consistency and frequency. Consistency in the content, 
frequency in the output so that elections is no longer just a, in this case this year, just a February, June, November thing. It's actually a year-long process, and then when we go into the legislative session, we inc include all of that, that it's really an ongoing situation. Um, going to objective three, we wanted to talk about accurate information, as we said before, and making sure that people have access to reliable information and that our community partners have access to reliable information where they don't know something, they can refer their constituents there. In objective four, we wanted to talk about a variety of mechanisms. We understand that um, attention spans differ, focuses differ, um, Print media is not necessarily for everybody. Um, there's a certain generation of people who need that ongoing phone access and media access and got to keep it moving with some colors. We also understand that there's another um, group of people that are traditional to the news media. And so it's important that when we have information that goes out, not only just on our website or our socials, but it's in the media, it's from trusted, reliable sources, nonpartisan, and non-candidate leaning. Um, objective five, we talked about establishing a mechanism for rostering unmet need. And I think one of the things that really excited me being new to the elections was there were so many different sources of information that I wasn't really sure where and how to get it. And I didn't even know what I didn't know. So one of the things that we really do, we've really tried to do is what I call read the room. And it's places, it's taking time for um, engagements such as these to not only come and listen, but take the time to go on that YouTube and really dissect what was being said. Um, it's very important to watch the body language, although you can't see a lot in these particular meetings. You can see the facial expressions, the intonations when people are conveying their urgencies or their, the things that are important. So we take additional time to look at those. We had recently um, took part in a town hall. We actually just went, we didn't take part in it. And to see the reactions of the constituents and their emotions with regard to elections and with their emotions, um, the things that concern them, it wasn't enough to just sit in that room at that time. So we had to go back and really dissect what were they trying to say? What did we miss? Did, did we hear that the first time around? And I think that is really important for us to go back and present to our communities that we really took the time to hear not just in passive conversation or, you know, at a lunch. We really took the time to hear. Um, the objective six, which was talking about a mantra, um, in past election cycles that I've been familiar with as a constituent, we've heard um, language that in some way can be obligatory or it can be... Um, you need to vote, you need to do this. Um, um, there's another term I'm looking for, but um, not necessarily encouraging or not necessarily inviting people into the process. It's You had to do it because this is who did it before. And so what we wanted to do is we really want to create um, language and begin our dialogue in everything that we do that encourages and invites people to the table, no different than you would a meal, that you would invite people to come and participate with you in this election cycle um, as part of they deserve to be there. Um, so that was really important for us. And also to not just have conversations about them, those, they. It's always, it's a we, it's a us. We can make a change. Um, not they did it, it's we can do it together. Um, lastly, in our objectives, and these really are not, our objectives are not limited to these seven, but these were the ones that stood back, is establishing a comprehensive civics engagement and election, elections participation initiative. Um, one of the things that we heard in that town hall was that the younger people don't know. Um, there has been no civics education, and we as elections officials and communities, we cannot always 
put those requirements on the educational system. Um, we have teachers that are taxed with their own requirements, and we have resources to pull some things together to create a comprehensive um, elections and civic engagement participation endeavor that can serve teachers and serve um, other entities, but could actually really not burden anybody else. And we can present that information um, consistently. We can also engage other civic organizations, nonpartisan, non-candidate, you're going to hear me say that all day, um, that really have an opportunity to, um, to participate. We look at um, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, we look at school activities. There was a robotics um, group that had a requirement to do a civic um, participation or a civic engagement in part of their robotics planning. And so our role is to help others, other entities identify how they can either take part with us or how we can serve them. Um, let's see. As I kind of alluded to before, we're looking at a multi-perspective multi focus. We're talking about the different literacy levels, um, and again, it goes back to breaking down barriers. We're looking at the cultural and the context. We're looking at a person-first versus identity-first communication, um, making sure that our language and what we present is appropriate, it's sensitive, it's respectful. Um, Something as simple as um, we are ser serving people with hearing impairments or s hearing disabilities versus the hearing impaired. Um, it's just those little twists on language that can make the difference on inclusion. Um, when we talk about culture and context, we're talking about linguistic linguistics. We had talked with um, some tribal, uh, some native native voters. And how do we present at the, as the elections division, or how do we, um, as government, how do we engage with you? What things have we done in the past that were disrespectful? Um, how can we approach? Um, and one, of the, one feedback I got was, we don't need anything from you. We want you to participate, but we don't need anything. And so it's very important that we listen and we hear what people are saying so that we can effectively and respectfully engage with them. We talked about um, making sure that there was factual information, digestible in volume, that was progressive and consistent. We also want to really uh, deal with the literacy versus the orality. And the literacy really comes into play when we're talking about do people really understand what they're voting for, what the positions are, the process, or are they limit, do they have limiting beliefs based on what somebody else has told them? And so we want to limit the barriers, limit those, um, limit those barriers by making sure that they have access to the information that they need in the manner that they need it. We're also talking about learning styles. Um, Anybody who has been a teacher understands that everybody does not learn the same. Um, some people are more tactical. Some people need to read. Some people need to hear it over and over again. Some people need to have that engagement. And so we want to make sure that everything that we offer has, has a little bit of something for everybody. We are heavily, heavily reliable, rely, reliant, excuse me, on our community-based conduits. Um, these organizations that are represented here are just a small um, percentage of those who we know are out there. Um, those which are represented, for those of you who can see the color, those who are represented in black, we've had multiple conversations with them. In some cases, they found us. In other cases, we found them. Those in purple, um, we've had introductions to, but we know that further engagement is to come. And those in the pinkish color, we have them on our agenda to meet with, but we haven't reached everybody. And we know that there are some others that really could bring something to the table, could help us develop better, could tell us what they need so that we can create for them. These groups of people um, are 
often gatekeepers to marginalized populations. They're gatekeepers to people who may not visit the Secretary of State's website, that may not ever engage in traditional civic engagement or the governmental civic engagement. And so we need these partners to help us convey the information. There's also have that trusted relationship with many of the constituents because they may be service providers, they may have that security or that self-sustainability. So these partners are critical. Um, one of the things that we found was in um, our communications, well, there's a handful of things that we found in our communications with these conduits was that translation, um, as we as we look at translation, translation is often presented as secondary. In other words, everything is English and then it gets translated to Spanish. And we talked about it in the, that in the beginning, but we need to really begin to develop things that are for that specific culture. Um, we also talked about, or what was also mentioned was that um, that family, familial engagement is important. And it was brought up that um, I don't know, the gentleman put it, how many of us, he was asking a group of people, how many of us were child translators? How many of us, our parents came to the United States or they were in the United States and they didn't speak any English, but because the children went through the educational system where they were taught English, were the translators in the household. And that really brought to fruition the need to include the entire family in this whole elections process. Those children can convey information, they might hear of information, and so to exclude them and make this voter education piece an 18 or older kind of engagement is really limiting our potential. So we want to ensure that we um, include that. We also want to look at the infrastructures and making sure that um, we've tapped into um, as many resources as we can to ensure that the information gets out. Um, one of the things that was asked for and communicated um, by the community and by those gatekeepers to the secretary, the deputy, and the chief was the need for language line services and a teleinterpreter. We are happy, happy, happy to say that we um, are still in the process of, of testing and piloting, but we do have language interpreter ser interpretive services, slightly different than traditional services in that um, an individual can call a local line. It is not toll free, but it is a local number. So we have secured three local numbers, 702, 725, and 775, which should encompass the state. The individual can call. They can, they're immediately asked for if they're speaking Spanish, press one, I believe. Any other language, press two. They can vocalize the language, or there is a list of numbers that they can choose, and they're directly connected to an interpreter. That saves a lot of frustration, I believe. Once that interpreter gets on the line, they are, initial, they are immediately connected to the elections team, the CAPS team, which is the public interfacing team that we call to answer questions related to elections. Um, we put this into use um, a couple times so far. Um, translations were good. We do have you know, some fine tuning, but the connection and the, um, the process was fairly seamless. So we're really excited about putting that in. This, both of these language line op options are available to the counties for use at no cost to them. So they are available for us to use at polling stations. We're trying to look at how we can navigate that um, because there are quite a few polling stations in the state, but we think that it's really gonna work for us. We also have um, services for the hearing impaired, so video services. We did put this into play last week. We had an opportunity to um, engage an individual who was, um, who had an individual, I have to say it right, an individual who had a hearing impairment. And he was in office, we went to go hook it up on the computer, and we found that because we were on a hot spot at the time, it didn't work well. So we picked up that cell phone, that trusty cell phone, got the interpreter on the line, I could see the interpreter, the man could see the interpreter, we were able to transaction our business no different than we were if it was a solely hearing, 
individual with hearing capacity. So that was really, really exciting to see. And um, that was like a hurrah. Um, this language line is available, um, specifically the telephonic, in over two, it's actually closer to 300 different languages, some of the very remote languages, so we're very excited about that. We have been looking at collaborations with different governmental resources. Um, one of the challenges that we have is, again, we talk about the print, and we talk about the social, but there's so many other mediums that we can use. So we are in um, current conversation. We're looking at um, the contractual process with Vegas PBS. Vegas PBS has agreed to work with us on development of some video media um, to put out to the public on those little educational pieces, how to's, how to's, the who's, the what's, the why's. Um, when I say who, we're talking about candidate office, not candidate. So I think that's very important. Um, and that's in different candidate offices throughout the state, not just the ones that we know about, but you know, what's the difference between the Board of Regents versus the Board of Education versus a Board Trustee? Those things kind of sometimes get convoluted. So um, we're very excited about that collaboration. And Vegas PBS, as you all know, knows how to do it. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're looking at, um, Particularly with Vegas PBS, Nevada Secretary of State, we have our website, we have a Facebook, and we have Twitter. Vegas, P which is okay, it's great, but it's somewhat limiting. Um, Vegas PBS adds to our momentum, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, their website, and other media outlets, along with some of the collaborations and the collaborative partners that they have throughout the state. So we're very, very excited about that. We're also talking about, um, we're in conversations with the library districts to make sure that they have the information that they need. We're also in pretty heavy conversation with the regional transportation authorities, making sure that the buses and the, um, both the traditional buses and the paratransit buses have those posters that are up in the um, areas. And we're also looking with the DM, we're working with the DMV network um, and other places that have captive audiences to ensure that voting information and civics information get out to the public. Um, we've worked closely, um, close conversations with the Nevada Governor's Council on Develop Developmental Disabilities, who, if you did not know, had put out a series of five videos on the elections process that um, avail that are availed in sign language, fully in sign language. We're looking at taking some of the creations through Vegas PBS and also making sure that they are available in sign language. Additionally, we're looking at the creations that come through Vegas PBS to have a voiceover capability um, and some cool graphics so that we can accommodate those other languages. Um, Currently, we have um, on our language access page, we have a few little things um, in Spanish, Filipino, and I believe Vietnamese. Um, we hope to have everything up that we have um, before April 1. We are looking at one pagers being kind of a fast fax. We looked at um, several juris jurisdictions to get some ideas on how to get information to people. Um, if you haven't seen the myths and facts, there were quite a few questions that came in after the presidential preference primary, and those were um, recorded and appropriate responses given out. And then also about elections when we talk about the accessibility and just general education. Oh, I want to go back. On the collaborations, we just talked, we, we are in conversation also with UNLV to help us um, through an internship program to help us man, uh, what do I want to say, evaluate um, the content that we put out um, to make sure that is appropriate. Through the Department of Liberal Arts and some of their language programs, we're looking to make sure that what we have is appropriate. And we're also looking at some of our community partners to see if it's within their scope and within their existing budget to help us as well. We don't want to ask to put any additional burden on community-based organizations, but we do want them to participate. So we are trying to engage and make sure that what we offer um, 
is strategic and culturally appropriate. Um, let's see. Our messaging mechanisms. I have quite a few on the fire. We're looking at workshops and fairs. And when I say fairs, we don't want it to be the traditional health fair where we just sit there and we hand you out a brochure. We want to engage. Um, so we are not only seeking out potential opportunities, but we will ask um, that the community as a whole reach to us. If you haven't heard from us, it might be that we don't know about you and we need to know about you. So we do ask that you reach out to us and ask us to come and give you some information. Um, when we talk about the ticker tape and the on screen, that is the DMV essentially, where they have those rotating um, video educational presentations to a captive audience and we're looking at what's available in division of welfare and support supportive services and some of their waiting areas because again that's a captive audience they have a lot of time that they're spending there and that's an awesome opportunity to get education out there we talked about the video that's coming through PBS that which will also be able to be parsed out to the various social medias um, video also can go on the web there is also um, PDFs that will be downloaded the social media as we spoke of. The transit posts, um, we're also looking to bring in QR codes on some of those transit posts and some of the um, bigger static presentations so that we can collect information. We can ask people what they think. We can ask them to do a survey. We can give them a QR code to an educational presentation while they're sitting on the bus for the hour and a half ride. Um, the QR codes will be a uh, tremendous accent to what we offer. Traditional that typically typically goes through the public information office would be the public service announcements, the press releases, maybe some radio time or some interviews and possibly um, some other messaging. We're also looking at um, town halls. We haven't really m mapped that one out yet. Um, periodicals, those mailers that come in your mail for your zip code. Um, we're looking at, we're also looking at an email listserv and the potential for um, do, how do we go about gathering email information? So is that a liability that we have the ability to take on? So those things are kind of sitting, we're thinking those out. And um, the local and the native newspapers, those have been traditional sources that reach specific communities. Um, largely cultural communities um, segments, so that's important. And then we're, we put billboards on here because we know that they are a messaging mechanism. We understand that they're very pricey, but we don't want to say that we didn't look at it. So this is out here um, for consideration. We have a proposed, proposed timeline on this um, presentation that you probably cannot see because it's a little bit blurred but um, we are looking at what can we do when can we get information out we want to be consistent again and frequent um, in evaluation is extraordinarily important in this language access process we want to ensure as noted I won't list them all we want to make sure we're hearing from the vast representation in the state. We don't want to um, have parity issues. We don't want to um, make sure, we don't want to have, when I say parity, the geographic parity. We want to make sure that all the cultures, all the languages are represented as much as humanly possible through our mandates. We want to make sure that we are hearing, we're listening, we're taking the time to hear what people say. And, and also looking to understand I didn't vote because I don't believe. Well, what does that really mean? And taking the time to investigate a little bit more. Um, we don't want to work off of our assumptions because that's what we always did, so that's what we'll keep doing. We're kind of thinking outside of the box, um, especially when we're receiving contradictory opinions. It, it validates investigation. Um, as noted before, we're looking at the body language when we speak to people, individuals, when we're asking questions. And are we willing to adjust from our norms? Um, I think that um, Deputy and the Secretary and the Chief have totally reflected that the need for looking at new things. We see the ease, we see you know, the, the registration process, the, the engagement with um, other interdepartmental agencies for registration. 
So we're looking at all of those things that we're putting in, but also what are we putting out? Are we getting feedback? Um, we do. There is a um, an opportunity, or there will be an opportunity, it's not up yet, on the website to give feedback. Good, bad, ugly, and different. Um, we want to serve. And so um, it's very important that we seek that out. We want to quantify messaging mechanisms. So for each one of those mechanisms, we are looking to see how can we gather the numbers to present to you. I haven't been to a presentation where you all have not asked for some numbers, so we want to make sure that we offer that. Um, that we're looking at concerns and we're openly conveying them. They're not, you know, oh, he said this or she said this. We if somebody, if it came up, we want to address it. And that are we looking at best practices? It's very important that we don't operate in a silo. We want to look at other successful states, other states that have not done quite as well, and make sure that we are looking at new perspectives and new opportunities. And then are we reaching our goals? Why or why not? Um, there may be some very valid reasons why we are or why we are not, and that is very important to us. We are looking at taking some of this information and actually mapping it out, putting it into GIS so that we can visualize it. Again, as I stated, we have surveys, and we're also looking at taking some of the commentary and using some um, natural language processing to find um, common themes or common focus. Um, and with that, do you all have any questions? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that is a lot of work for 90 days, so thank you for sharing that with our committee today. And with that, we'll start in Carson City for any member questions. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. And with that, we'll go to Zoom. No questions. Thanks, Vice Chair. Thank you. And with that, we'll come back to Las Vegas. Any questions, members? Chair. I'll, I'll be very brief. Thank you for your indulgence, Madam Vice Chair. And Ms. Hagen, thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Um, looking at, uh, I think it's slide nine, I really, the messaging mediums, the social media, you know, I work with uh, young, young people, and I see so many young people uh, where their social media is their main mode of communication. It's not a phone call. It's, you know, I can get a message through Instagram when I'm in a Wi-Fi area and then, you know, I'll respond. So I, I appreciate that the Secretary's office is going to try to reach out to people via social media because I think a lot of a lot of people get their news through this. And um, I, I think that might be a great way to encourage people to, to participate and to vote. And also, um, you know, if there is a need for translation and, and help with language access, to make sure they know that that's there. So just more of a comment. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you, Deputy Secretary and Ms. Hagen. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. And with that, we thank you again. Uh, today we've really been discussing access, and we appreciate all the work of the Secretary of State's office. With that, I'm going to thank uh, the Chair for allowing me to chair some of this meeting, and I am now going to give back the reins to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. You did a fantastic job, and anytime uh, you're, you're welcome to take the gavel because you do a tremendous job. Thank you so much. With that, we're going to move on to agenda item number seven, updates from counties on the implementation of voting in detention facilities pursuant to Assembly Bill 286. And first item on our agenda, we have Sheriff Richard Hickox and Under Sheriff Leah Rosco from Churchill County. And I'm not sure if they're on Zoom or up at the Legislative Building in Carson City, but thanks for your patience and please begin whenever you're ready. Hello, this is uh, Sheriff Richard Hickox from Churchill County. Uh, we thank you for your time here today. We did um, implement a policy that we worked with our county clerk, which you met earlier today to um, develop and establish. We had at the time, um, February 6th for voting, we had a total of 42 inmates in our facility. We had one inmate that uh, chose to participate in the voting process. Um, we did have that inmate uh, not be registered prior to that day, and so he did register and was able to vote. I don't know what else information you would like to um, get, but uh, we're open to questions if you have any. Thank you very much, uh, Sheriff Hickox. Members, any questions? I'll start here in Sawyer Building. Up in Carson City or on Zoom, any questions, members? No, thanks, Chair. No. 
Thank you very much, Sheriff. Thank you for joining us. And I'll come back to the Sawyer Thank you. Building. Thank you very much for, for being here presenting. Uh, Clark County, we are very lucky to have Captain Nita Schmidt from the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for your patience. And thank you for presenting here. Hi, good morning. Thank you. I am Captain Nita Schmidt. I work for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. I am currently assigned to Detention Services Division. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department uh, operates the Clark County Detention Center. We have two facilities that are under uh, the same name as the Clark County Detention Center, and that's our main facility that most people are familiar with in uh, downtown Las Vegas. And then our other satellite facility that is in the northwest side of town is the North Valley Complex. Both of the facilities together, we average a population of about 2,800 inmates in custody. Uh, we were happy uh, to work with the Clark County uh, voting officials to develop our program with the priority of ensuring uh, fair access as well as ensuring that there was secrecy of the, the ballots and security for the voting staff. Our uh, plan was, was put in place. We had no grievances or no issues throughout the process. We were able to pass on information to the voting officials so that they could facilitate uh, voter registration and voting for 23 uh, inmates that were in custody during the time of the PPP. And we look forward to work, continuing to work with them as we look to moving towards using some more automated systems in uh, creating a place for voting in our facility for other jails in, in the Clark County area. While we're the largest, we're the largest uh, detention facility for jails in the state, there's uh, several other facilities that are in the Clark County area. Um, we have the Henderson facility, North Las Vegas, and the City of Las Vegas Detention Center. So our goal is to establish the ability for voting to take place in the Clark County Detention Center for inmates, and then the other facilities would be able to transport to our secure facility to be able to uh, effectively be able to vote. Thank you very much, Captain Schmidt. Thank you for your efforts at making sure that, uh, that there is access there. Members, any questions here? Assemblywoman Miller. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Captain, for those numbers. Uh, I think 23 in a um, PPP, which especially our first time here in the state doing it, um, is actually a pretty solid number. And so with that, my questions would just be, one, um, were these individuals people who had reached out to you, the officers, about their ability to vote, or was it, as it's um, required in the legislation, was there communication and information given to the individuals that the voting would be occurring and available? Also, of those 23 people, were those 23 people who were already registered to vote? So if you could share if there was any people that also registered and, and then um, voted, and Lastly, or you know what, Chair, could I have a follow-up after that? I, I don't want... Please go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so we put out information. We, we provide uh, most of our information to our inmates through a kiosk system. It allows them, prompts them several times in order to go and collect, uh, read new information as there's updates. Um, our, our, our inmate handbook, uh, as well as other materials are in there. So we placed materials on there to provide everybody information on uh, the process for the PPP. Um, there was existing information already on there to give them the access to be able to request voting materials, where to send uh, requests to, uh, to, for us to be able to send them registration documents. So that was all existing, but we uh, enhanced that for this uh, voting, se voting session. As far as specifics on who was able to register or, or out of that number who registered or if those people um, required any assistance or where they got that information from. The 23 that I referred to, those are people that, um, those are inmates or offenders in our custody that reached out to us 
per our directions and said, hey, I want information to vote. We then connected them to the voting officials and then they are the ones that helped to facilitate them to vote. I don't have data on if they were registered before or not. Um, I know some staff from Clark County is here. They may be able to provide that at a later time or today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, follow up, Assemblywoman. Thank you, Chair. Um, with that, I'm also interested if you may not have the number during the time of the PPP, the 23 that voted, how many individuals were actually incarcerated during that time? Because I know there was quite a few more than 23 or even a few hundred. If you would have that number or ballpark. And also, could you just speak a little further? You mentioned about automated systems. What types of automated systems were you referring to or envisioning? Yes, ma'am. So we are, we average out our population, uh, throughout the month and our population usually hovers around 2,800. Sometimes it's a little bit higher, sometimes it's a little bit lower. Um, so that would be the rough estimate. I don't, I don't know specifically on that day what it would be. We have some follow up meetings set up. I think we have one next week with the voting officials behind me and we are going to talk about, uh, what types of devices we will be placing into the facility to help, um, make sure that we can have greater access. I know that there's uh, some different discussions. We've got data access in there, which is a plus already because uh, jails are, are not very great for Wi-Fi signal. Um, so some of those barriers have already been removed, but it'll be completely up to them and, and us to have the discussion about what machines would be the most appropriate to, pl to place in the facility. Thank you, Captain. Any follow-up, Assemblyman? No, thank no. you, Chair. Uh, Assemblyman Hibbets. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Captain, for being here. A uh, quick question about, uh, you had mentioned the municipal facilities of Las Vegas Henderson and North Las Vegas. Do the municipalities of Boulder City and Mesquite have their own facilities, or do they utilize a different one? As far as I know, I'm not, I'm not familiar where Mesquite is booking or holding their, their inmates in. I know that uh, Boulder City uses Henderson, um, so they would fall underneath Henderson. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And to our member, uh, Senator Daly in Carson City and the members on Zoom, anyone have any questions for Captain Schmidt? If I could just ask you one question, Captain. Absolutely. Pig piggybacking on Assemblyman Hibbett's question. Uh, you mentioned that there was there was voting available uh, at the Clark County Detention Center in the North Valley facility, but then at the city of Las Vegas detention facility, Henderson, were, was voting available there as well, just under through the municipalities? Yes, sir. So we, uh, in when we were aware that this was coming down, we wanted to be um, outreaching to make sure that we pulled everybody together. So we invited Henderson, uh, North Las Vegas, City of Las Vegas, set up meetings with our partners in Clark County, and we all met together to come up with a process that we could all effectively use to be able to be consistent in making sure that we were able to offer this. Um, I had follow-up conversations with them about, hey, do you guys have any issues, any, anything like that? They all were successful in being able to place this information out. And um, I don't have any information uh, that I can speak of on their data that the county folks may have that, but I know that we work together with them. Thank you very much, Captain. You're welcome. Uh, oh, Assemblyman Miller. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, one one uh, final question, and again, this is, I, I never want Clark to feel like we're picking on them, but it's just Clark is the largest and yes, uh, most robust. But how, when you refer to, um, you know, we had informed individuals about their right to vote. And I know that before, well, during the development of the legislation, there was discussions about even that um, the jails had like a handbook of procedures mm -hmm. and things like that. And we had asked for that to be updated as well. But could you um, just share how how were individuals informed and maybe not just how, but also when? Because we know every individual is inside of the jail for a different length of time. So could you just discuss that a little bit? Absolutely. And, and for us, uh, our population is uh, a mix of a lot of travelers that come into our city for, for visitation, uh, for different vacation purposes. Um, and our population turns over rather quickly. Captain, so, are you saying they're staying in the jails for vacation purposes? No, or they're no, no, just no. having too much fun no, on vacation? Yeah, I know. And, yeah, it's true. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so we have a lot of people that will cycle in and out of the facility very quickly. 
um, a lot of those folks don't even go upstairs for housing. Um, so they remain in booking for a few hours and then they're released. Um, how we communicate uh, to the masses is we have information that is in our, our hard copy and our inmate handbooks. We have those in uh, different forms in Braille. We have uh, hard copies that people actually can look through. They're in Spanish as well. And then we have our informational kiosks. Existing information has been there for several years on how to vote and who to contact, um, including information on addresses um, and who to reach out to. They have always had the ability to request from our detention facility a voter registration application. That is something that our staff would pull off of the uh, voter registration information for the state and send them the copy along with directions on where to mail that into. When we were preparing for this election, we prepared something in conjunction with Clark County staff to be able to message out on what that process was and uh, where to go, what to look for, things uh, that were qualifying things, um, identification, if they needed a pen to be able to complete the application in. Um, that information was placed on our kiosk separate from the inmate handbook as a notice to all inmates. Thank you, Captain. You are Thank welcome. You, Thank you very much, Captain. Thank you, Assemblywoman Miller, for your efforts on this legislation, trying to make sure uh, that, uh, you know, pre-adjudication folks can still participate uh, in, in democracy. And thank you, Captain Schmidt, and to all the staff at uh, CCDC, North Valleys, all the other detention facilities for making this happen. I'd like to now go to our next presenter. We have Ryan Hensley, Detention Services Manager, Washoe County Sheriff's Office. And I Mr. Hensley, I'm not sure if you're in Carson City at the Legislative Building or on Zoom, but please proceed whenever you, you want to. Hi, Chair Ornshaw, uh, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Corey Solferino representing the Washoe County Sheriff's Office. I do have uh, Ryan Hensley over to my left. Uh, he is my uh, newly appointed division uh, manager for detention. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to really commend uh, Deputy Chief Fred Haas and uh, Captain Schmidt and the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, we really worked together on this to make sure that we were consistent for inmate voting rights across jurisdictions. Uh, we do run the only uh, adult detention facility in northern Nevada and the greater Reno Sparks, Washoe County area. Uh, our average daily population is about 1,200, so to anticipate Assemblywoman Miller's uh, questions, I do uh, have a couple of data points that I brought up in reference to that uh, regarding our, our budget presentations last month to Washoe County. Uh, so for the month of February, we were currently at 1163 as my computer locks up and my Excel spreadsheet goes away, I apologize. Uh, we were at 1163 for the month of the primary, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Division Manager Ryan Hensley to talk about our implementation for the inmate voting. Good <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I just wanted to speak briefly about this process of which we advertised the, the election process. Uh, we flooded the housing units with flyers, put posters up all over their housing, <clears throat> pardon me, put, put flyers up over the housing units to inform them all. Additionally, we put flyers on their kiosks and on their tablets that they get. So when they log in, they would be notified that it is in fact an election year and that they were encouraged to take, uh, to take uh, or to participate in the process. We had 69 inmates request to vote. Of those 69, uh, 43 of them could not be confirmed as residents, but 26 did participate in the voting process. Um, we had no grievances, and I just did a quick count, it, and it appears that eight of them were previously registered before uh, this election cycle. Um, if, are there any questions? Members, any questions uh, for our representatives from the Washoe County Sheriff's Office? I'll start up in Reno. Senator Daly, any questions? No, thank you. No. Uh, members on Zoom? No, thanks, Chair. No. And members down here at the Sawyer Building? I don't see any questions. Thank you uh, very much for the presentation. Uh, I guess. Uh, no, I think, actually, I think I've answered my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Appreciate all the information, everything you're doing to make sure people can participate. 
With that, members, we will move on to agenda item number eight, a presentation related to facilitating voting by eligible persons and detention facilities. We are very fortunate to have today with us representatives from the uh, American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada and from Silver State Voices. So thank you very much for your patience and for your presentation today. Good morning, Chair uh, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Atar Hasibula, first name spelled A-T-H-A-R, last name H-A-S-E-E-B-U-L-L-A-H. I serve as the Executive Director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada, joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Sidmira Ramit, just to my left. Uh, she's a voting rights attorney for the ACLU of Nevada. She'll share her uh, name spelling in just a moment. Um, and Emily Prasad Zamora to my right, uh, who leads Silver State Voices. Uh, both of our organizations are members of the Let Nevadans Vote Coalition. Uh, we were grateful to work with Assemblywoman Miller during the legislative session 2023 uh, to make sure AB 286 was passed. So uh, Emily will share a little bit uh, about where some of the items are at. Um, Sammy Sadmira will follow up with uh, respect to what we've received in response and I'll kind of lay out the, the pathway uh, and where we see enforcement of, of this particular uh, piece of legislation moving forward. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Emily Prasad Zamora, and the last name is spelled P-E-R-S-A-U-D hyphen Z-A-M-O-R-E. And I'm the Executive Director of Silver State Voices. Um, thank you so much uh, to the committee for the invitation today. Um, from our observations and a lot of the work, uh, this is, um, as my fellow colleague indicated, this was a bill that was uh, our priority, and we advocated a uh, a lot for this uh, particular piece of legislation. Um, from a lot of our conversations, it seems that um, there's been a lot of great work from the registrars in the 17 counties in being proactive um, with the uh, county, with the folks in counties to ensure that there's good implementation of the bill. Um, so I just wanted to take the time to commend the registrars, um, especially in Clark and Washoe, um, to really ensure that there is, that they're doing everything in their part uh, to ensure that folks um, that are incarcerated are getting the ability to participate. We do know that there is um, still you know, a desire to ensure that the, the model uh, of polling uh, locations just strictly for inmates um, to be put in place. And we're really hoping that that is put into fruition um, for the primary and for the general uh, location as we feel like it's the most ideal form of um, of voting and most accessible for folks that are that will be in jail. Um, our only other comment that we wanted to indicate uh, before I pass the mic over is that um, we still know that there is a lot of folks who feel like they don't know that this is something um, that is a right, and this is just from conversation from a lot of the organizing work that folks are doing, um, a lot of our community partners, and so we do have the intention of doing particular work and doing mailings into some of the jails for the primary and for the general to ensure that folks know that this is uh, a right that they have. And thank you. Good afternoon, Sadmira Ramich for the record, spelled S-A-D-M-I-R-A-R-A-M-I-C. Uh, first, I want to thank, thank you all for your continued commitment in assuring that this bill is implemented and uh, making sure that the fundamental rights of individuals in custody are protected. Uh, we continue to follow this process in terms of implementation and have requested records from multiple counties and jails throughout Nevada uh, and since have received those records. Uh, these were made after the presidential primary preference in February and were received sometime throughout February uh, and are continuing to trickle in uh, based on what we requested. But based on the information that we received in those responses, we do still have concerns regarding access that is provide, being provided to these individuals in custody. Um, there was varied responses in relation to our request. Uh, our request really followed exactly what AB 286 uh, outlined for, uh, regarding policies and procedures, but also those specific requirements within the bill. 
Uh, Based on the responses that we've received, again, we have concerns about access that is being provided. So for example, some of the responses we received, um, one of the counties said, uh, we are aware of the law and we are monitoring. And that's ex the extent of the response that they gave us in regard to what they're doing to comply with this law. Uh, others have provided us with policies and procedures that relate to voting. However, you can clearly tell that these were outlined policies as they were riddled with misinformation on how individuals can vote, and that information does have a direct impact on their eligibility to vote. Uh, one example I can give related to that is that they will have information stating that if you are a felon and have a conviction, you are not able to vote. Clearly, these policies were put in place prior to 2019, so severely outdated. We also had received several responses in which uh, the policies and procedures essentially cherry-picked portions of AB 286 to implement, uh, so that is concerning for us. This is specifically related to, well, I should back up a little bit. In terms of AB 286, we understand that the access and the level of access was left to the jails to determine, recognizing the fact that um, individuals, jails have different functions and they, and they function differently. However, there were specific requirements within this bill and those were outlined uh, primarily for certain reasons. Um, these individual jails have ignored these directives from the legislature. So for some examples that I can give uh, directly related to the data that we received is that, for example, uh, five out of the 12 responses we received either had no policies or procedures on voting or were not directly responsive to AB 286. We had 10 out of the 12 responses that we received did not have any procedures on how a voter detained in another county can vote. Six of the 12 responses did not have any process for same-day registration and seven of the 12 responses did not have mandates or requiring that, uh, as uh, Assemblywoman Miller pointed out, requiring these postings regarding voting within prominent locations within the jails. So there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and we have great concern in terms of access that's being provided within the jails throughout the state. And these individuals that are in custody deserve to have their uh, access to voting. They are, should have the same access as other individuals and their vote matters just as any other eligible vote within the state. And we have had quite some time for compliance to take place and since have had an election that has taken place, so disenfranchisement has already occurred. So I'll just highlight those concerns, thank you. And, and Chair, uh, a couple of the points that we want to note, um, you know, we worked uh, pretty tirelessly. I think everybody remembers kind of the trajectory of this bill during the legislative session. It had many different iterations. There was a lot of compromises involved because we understood the difference between rural communities, between urban communities, between counties that have strong technology infrastructure and counties that don't, and between cities that are well staffed and, and cities that might not be. Um, but one thing that did come up uh, pretty consistently was the deadline for or the date for implementation. January 1st of 2024 was provided specifically so that individuals had the right to vote in the 2024 uh, elections to occur. We're going to have three in Nevada. One's already occurred. We have two left. The challenge we've run into in terms of the request that we've submitted uh, and receiving these types of responses after February of 2024, including responses that we're, we're aware of the bill and we're monitoring when there's a directive by law to implement, to create and implement a policy that allows for such, doesn't leave us a lot of wiggle room. Part of the reason why uh, we had reached out to ask to be able to share this information is because we're hoping that some of these jails and counties, county jails and city jails are, are monitoring this meeting right now. And to those that are monitoring and listening, um, we have reached out multiple times. We've offered the opportunity to go through this one by one to make sure we think a proposal is in, is in line in conformance with AB 286's requirements um, and with the Constitution. And to date, there's a few counties that have taken us up on that. Uh, a few of the registrars have as well. And there's some that have outright dismissed that. Uh, to any county or any city that continues to violate the law by not providing this plan, Consider April 15th, which is a little over three weeks away for us, uh, our version of match day, which for students in medical school, you get to apply for residency and you figure out which school you're matching with. Well, we're going to find out 
which counties and cities get to match with us on that day because there's going to be lawsuits filed against every single one of those uh, counties and cities that are in nonconformance and noncompliance, those that haven't responded after that, and we are being left no choice but to do that. Unfortunately, because we're at uh, an interim hearing, there's no ability to bring uh, folks in from each of these places in such a timely fashion before the, the June primary to make sure this plan is in place. And realistically, those that have complied, and we'll give an example um, in, in terms of responsiveness, Nye County, which I've been a very vocal critic of for the last several years, did provide us with documentation back. So we're able to at least vet through a full plan. And you compare that to the responses we received from a place like Mineral County, which basically told us they're just monitoring at this point. We're not here specifically to yell or threaten counties or cities, right? We're trying to ensure compliance with the law, and we're in a finite uh, time period. We're, we're only a couple months away from the primary. So to those counties and jails that have not created a plan or the ones that have not yet updated that and provided it over to us, we'd encourage them to the degree that they're tuning in to do so. Uh, to avoid what might end up becoming unnecessary litigation over these types of issues that I think we all want to prevent, but it, it just seems that there hasn't been the same level of diligence and implementation with respect to this bill as there have been with some of the other ones. Uh, with that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, and I'm very troubled by by what you're reporting to me uh, as to the, the not finding that the law is being followed. Um, are you finding in the in the jurisdictions where you don't believe AB 286 is being followed that the issue is with the managers of the detention facility, with the election officials for that jurisdiction, or both? Well, you know, I think that's probably a question that's better asked to the, the registrars from each of those counties. It appears there's distinctions in each of these communities. The Secretary of State, I know, has also been working with each of these communities. And you know, part of the reason why we're giving a few extra weeks here before we jump into legal action on something like this is because there's at least a couple models that they can follow now if they're looking to you know, what's been new. I'm not saying copying and pasting is a good, you know, a good idea or a good thing considering individual needs and what availability looks like. But there are plans that are out there. And there's also plans in other communities. One of the interesting, that, interesting uh, presentations we've heard during the last couple months on our end at the ACLU was from uh, individuals who oversaw, this was in Northern Nevada, we attended a presentation by the, the Northern Nevada International Center. And there was a warden from a max security prison in Iraq who disclosed and shared the details of how they've had jail voting in place for over 20 years in Iraq at a high security prison. And it seems like our counties are struggling to get, at least some of the counties are struggling to get that off the ground. It, it just is jarring. And so because that responsiveness has been different and there doesn't appear to be the same level uh, of interaction between every county and every city with their own registrars, let alone the Secretary of State, um, there, there are challenges there. Uh, it's part of the reason why you know we requested this presentation is we want to give another courtesy if there is non-compliance to comply. You have an additional few weeks here before we we you know, go down that rabbit hole. And quite frankly, we'd rather not go down that rabbit hole uh, of legal action, but we feel like there's going to be limited opportunity. So you know the reason why I, I stated April 15th was the date is because with the June primary coming, we don't want any of these individuals to have their right to vote constructively denied in that primary as well. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Up in, oh, Vice Chair Mosca. Thank you so much. I just had a question because um, you had said requested records. Do these uh, records of like we saw on ease how many people are voting, does it also go up to the Secretary of, this, of State so that we can see that? If it's our uh, records requests? Thank you. Just just uh, in general, do you know if it's going, are we rolling that up to the Secretary of State's office so that we as a committee can see how many people have voted from jail? I believe the Secretary of State would have the first access to that piece of information. Unfortunately, one of the deficiencies of our Public Records Act is documents that are, or items that are not already produced, they're not necessarily required to disclose. So it's not necessarily an interrogation on behalf uh, of the ACLU when we do records requests. They may, in fact, have some level of a plan that's in place. They just didn't turn it over. So that's part of the request. But I believe the Secretary of State would have that information first. Um, we've been in pretty regular contact with the Secretary's office about it. And we know the Secretary's office has been working uh, diligently through all of these issues to try to get compliance. We also know there's been uh, turnover in more than one county over the last several months. And so that changes things a bit in terms of getting 
uh, implementation records down, uh, but I believe the secretary would have access to that. You just have to ask them directly on it. Thank you very much. Any follow-up, Vice Chair Mosca? Thank you, Chair. I think that would be helpful to have that information at a future meeting. Thank I agree. You. If that's something that the Secretary's Office could provide the committee, I'd sure appreciate it. Any other questions up in Carson City or for members on Zoom? Just a com comment uh, slash question. I don't know if it'll be a question or not, uh, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I, I share your ahead, yeah. I, I share your concerns over the uh, non-implementation and various things, and I think uh, your time periods are, are more than generous. And you saw the law says the first of January, um, and I'm concerned that some of it is just political, and people want to thumb the nose at the state. As I recall from this piece of legislation uh, going through the legislature last session because uh, there was some more requirements that were going to be put on to uh, the various facilities whether they could have complied with that or not and you, you're right there was some compromise back and forth but it was my understanding that all of those facilities indicated to us uh, in the legislative session that they were already complying with uh, most of this. Maybe they needed to update a few things, but they already had a process in place. So now I'm hearing that they don't have any. We're monitoring, and, and there is no actual uh, compliance with the law, even though they indicated they had that uh, compliance. So I, I'm with you. Carry on with your, your enforcement lawsuit portion of it. We're not in session. Um, but I think that would be unnecessary and unfortunate uh, if we have to take it up again in the next legislative session, uh, I'm, I'm sure my colleague uh, who, who introduced the legislation will be chomping at the bit to make, make sure some of that happens. So uh, it's concerning to me as well, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Daly. Um, any questions that I did? Anybody want to be recognized? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, members, we are now going to move on to agenda item nine, public comment. This is our second round of public comment. Again, I want to remind anyone who wishes to make public comment, uh, please remember to state your name for the record and to limit your comments to two minutes per person. LCB staff will time each speaker during public comment to ensure everyone has a fair opportunity to speak. Again, to call in to provide public comment, you can dial the following phone number, 888-475-4499. Again, that's area code 888-475-4499. When prompted for a meeting ID, enter the following code, 880-2469-4191, then press pound. Again, you enter this code, 880-2469-4191, then press pound and follow the instructions. Uh, before we go to the phone lines, I'd like to see if there's anyone who wishes to make public comment. I'll start in Carson City. I don't see anyone out there, so if you're standing behind one of the columns or don't be bashful, don't see anyone in Carson City though, <laughs> here at the Sawyer Building. We've got a lot more people in here, but I don't see anybody coming up to make public comment here at the Sawyer Building and broadcasting if we can go to the phone lines. Chair, the line is open and working, but we have no callers at this time. Thank you, broadcasting and members. I know it's been a long day, but if we could just maybe wait about a minute just in case anybody's calling in and wants to participate. Uh, I got a comment. Please state your name for the record and please proceed. <laughs> Uh, I am not on the phone. I'm virtual, uh, Senator, uh, Vice Chairman Arnold Thomas here. Uh, you want me to wait or go ahead and make comment? Vice Chair Thomas, please uh, go ahead and make, make your public right. comment. And thank you again for joining us earlier. Yeah, good deal. Thank you uh, for the time uh, committee uh, and all those that presented. Uh, so regarding the individuals who are incarcerated, so uh the hope is that there's two or three a uh, bureau of indian affairs uh detention centers where native american inmates are incarcerated in the state 
So the hope and the request is that outreach is made to those facilities as well. Uh, and then uh, also, uh, and then following up regarding uh, the comments made by the Secretary of State's office regarding uh, uh, advertisement and other type of information that will be uh, placed on the PPS station in Las Vegas. So in northeastern Nevada, uh, the the PBS affiliate that broadcasts a lot of information is uh, the PBS Channel 7, uh, KUED, yeah, that's KUED in Salt Lake City. And their uh, coverage is uh, the whole northeastern Nevada region. So if outreach can be made to that PBS affiliate as well, uh, and then also another request regarding the Shoshone language. It was mentioned that it is being offered uh, in Nye County. Uh, we would like to expand that to include uh, Northeastern uh, tribes because we are Shoshone speaking uh, individuals. Uh, any and all uh, information re related to campaigns and, and voting uh, on the issue of voting, I am also disabled. I'm totally, totally and legally blind. So the request is that uh, another. And Vice Chair another, Thomas, uh, we are at two minutes. So if you could wrap up your yeah, comments, just, thank you just again. Another, just another revision of that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, if anyone runs out of time during the public comment period, you can submit your ideas via email. Uh, regular snail mail, fax. Uh, we, we announced those earlier and they are on the uh, agenda too if anybody wants to submit something if they ran out of time on public comment. Broadcasting, is there anyone else on the phone lines who wishes to make public comment? Chair, the lines are open and working, but we have no callers at this time. Thank you, Broadcasting. Uh, with that, members, I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. Thank our presenters. Thank our, our staff from LCB who made this happen with you know both parts of the state, being able to participate in Zoom links to presenters all over in different Walker River Paiute tribe up, up in uh, Duck Valley. So thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair.